Sorry, my phone is ringing right now. No, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put it in my speaker. So uh, our MC tonight is Kelly Smith. Um, this is the time I usually kind of like banter. She is driving up from Austin, so she hit a little bit of traffic. So she will be coming in right quickly soon. She, oh, well, she is here. But so what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just audible and go ahead and have Tyler do his market update. This is meant just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on in the market. It's real world numbers. However you want to uh, accept the information is up to you. Uh, this is not meant for making decisions. It's meant for you to kind of an analyze yourself. Uh, and then when he's done, we'll, we'll properly introduce Kelly. And if you're watching online, love it. Uh, please like, share, comment, subscribe. Tyler, are you here? Well, there we go. There we go. Everybody, this is Ty Waldrop. Wow. Chocolate? Come on now. How many of these we've done? I don't know. Uh, anyway, we got, okay, so this is just data basically for uh, the DFW area. So uh, DFW market, this, this is data actually comparing 2000, uh, November 2018 to November 2000, I'm mean, sorry, to uh, November 2019. Oh, he's talking over there. Uh, so it's just showing how the performance was in the market. Um, nationally, new housing permits were up to a 12-year high of 1.46 million units. Total household debt has increased for 21 consecutive quarters, which it's now 13.95 trillion. That's entire household debt. That's not just... Um, that's not just mortgages, which that's actually 1.3 trillion higher than it ever has been. His personal household debt is more 1.3 trillion higher than it ever was at the peak of uh, 2008. Doesn't mean anything, and necessarily the delinquency rates are actually very low. But household uh, debt is going up. That that could lead to issues in the future. Well, I don't think you can see that. Um, the information here that act that we. It's kind of important is the supply is continuing to, to decrease or it's, it's going down, so the prices will continue to rise. But what's happening, and it's in all the areas of DFW, you can see it in general, the supply factors are kind of increasing, so there's, there's more supply. Supply has decreased, so demand goes up. Price is going to continue to rise. But what's going to happen, and I'll, I did a comparison at the end of the graphs so we can kind of see what graphs shifted from 2018 to 2019. What's going to happen is, to substitute for that, all of these days on market are going to increase. So all of the numbers that are going to affect the actual, how long it has to be listed are going to go up. So in Dallas, you can see average price and median price. Those things don't really tell you. Median price is a little bit more accurate for our information. Uh, that's just the middle number of all the list of houses sold. That continues to rise, even as we have these kind of fluctuating shifts in the market. Tarrant County, same thing. Again, month supply in the days on market. Days on market seems to be increasing over last year. Again, November 2018, it, you know, it increased 7.3%. Uh, you know, so. so the next one, Collin County, this is, these are extraordinarily high prices for Collin County, but Plano, all of that new build up there is going to create issues in terms of um, sales, and those are higher end, higher end market sales. We're talking single family investors, mostly up to two hundred fifty thousand. Um, and Denton County, I was surprised about this. I was not expecting that kind of a high price for the average in Denton County. I didn't know that, but again, days on market in Denton is up to two months, so it increased nine percent over November of last year. And again, the graph at the end kind of, it's laid over the other graph. I don't know if you can see it. Anyway, this is for, that didn't print out right. Anyway, this is for November 2019. What, these, the graphs at the top, these are uh, units sold. They're almost identical. But the ones down here, days on market, it's literally the exact same pattern. It's just shifted up. So it's just an increase in the days on market or the decrease in the, the percentage you're going to get for your house. So, so some of the fundamental things are not necessarily changing. The prices are continuing to go up, but what's happening? 
So I believe in probably in 2020, the top three graphs, which are like, I can't even say, I don't know why it doesn't say over there, but um, those numbers are going to, oh, I can't see it up there. It's new listings, pending sales, and closed sales. Those graphs were identical. So it's like the, the nominal value, the number of stuff hasn't changed, just the amount of time you're going to have it on the market or the price you're going to get versus what you actually listed it for. Those graphs have shifted. So they might shift again. I just, there, there's... You don't really know, but it's, it's likely that that's going to happen. So what does that mean as an investor? Just take that into account when you're assessing your investments. If you've got more days on the market, that's more holding costs. Um, I think, uh, summer, yeah. Um, again, the su supply-driven metrics, those are continue. Inventories are going to continue to increase. Prices will increase. But again, we're going to get the, you know, the floods just up and down on your days on market. All this data is at the North Texas Real Estate Investment, I mean, Real Estate Information Systems. It's free. That's pretty much it. Anybody have any questions? If not, Miss Kelly Smith is going to come up and do some real stuff. Can you hear me? There we go. Awesome, y'all. So I, I love hearing that the market is doing great. The only things that are changing a little bit is days on market, which historically winter months are always slower than spring and summer months for obvious reasons. Yeah. Most people don't want to move. So it's all positive news. It's, all, it's, it's basically the prices are still going up. The houses are still selling. They're sitting on market a little bit longer versus over last year. That's what you expect. So the National Realtors Magazine or Nas Nas National Association of Realtors Magazine put out an article that I put on my social media if you follow me. I think it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, the top 20 investment markets to look into. Austin was number one and DFW was number six. So this wow. just further confirms why. Yeah. That was out of the entire nation. And I've been looking at Houston, too, and it's the same. I mean, they're... Well, Houston they're was like 46. And well, I'm Antonio saying, I'm yeah, somewhere. it's... Yeah. They're, all, they're all different per market, but... Well, I appreciate it. So if there was one thing that you could say to everyone about helping... So I saw that percent of list yep. is low, is small. It's, no, it's low over last year. Again, right. the top three numbers, which are number of sales. So the nominal value of the amount of houses listed is the same, basically, but they're not being sold as fast. Yeah. But the prices are still increasing. So you see the Which what, is what's absorbing so, that are just the days on market. Yeah. Well, and so what I would take away for that, if y'all are using financing of any sort, even though the prices, the ARVs are going to be higher, if the days on market have increased, you're going to have to calculate that additional holding cost into your sales price. So if the average days on market is 90 days, and that's probably not necessarily true, but 90 days, most lenders are going to give you an ARV at 90 days, so you will sell quicker than the rest of the market. So sometimes it's better to undercut so that you can minimize your, uh, your holding costs your holding or whatever, cost your holding costs. So, yeah. so fantastic, I love it. I love hearing Boom. good news. It's always good news, even if the market was crashing, there's gonna be foreclosures. Does anybody have questions? Does anybody have any questions? Sorry, I'm blinded by the light. I can't even see you. <laughs> no questions. Good. That means it was easy information, and it's all good. We'll all have questions when it's negative, right? <laughs> so, so now I get to do my official introduction of Kelly Smith. Everybody, this is Kelly Smith with Easy Capital uh, out of Austin. She, she graced us with her presence, driving eight stop. hours through the wind, the cold, and the rain. From Traffic Austin. was horrendous, y'all. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> Everybody give it up for Tyler. <laughs> Smartest person I know. So, Kelly, if you don't know Kelly, she is a beast on social media. She's a beast on lending. She closes about 10 billion deals a, a week. So, <laughs> I wish I'd have flown here if that was the case. <laughs> on, on your private helicopter. helicopter. So y'all yeah, yeah. feed me some deals. I'm only kidding. So, so Kelly has been in this business for a long time. I've known her since the first day I was in this business. Um, we've both been in different companies along the way. But uh, the entire time, she's been extremely professional, extremely loud. That's probably why we like each other. Birds of a feather. Or is right? that presu presumptive? Birds of a feather. You know, it's anyway. not often a woman wants to be referred to as a beast. So as I get Julie's <laughs> up, uh, why don't you tell everybody about yourself? So um, as you shared, I'm a hard money lender. Uh, we're Easy Street Capital. Um, we are, what's different between us and everyone else, and I'll give you just the quick pitch. We are going to underwrite the property before we send you a term sheet. That is saving you the time and money of an appraisal. So we enclose in as little as 48 hours. We're not charging you for that. We don't charge junk fees, underwriting, processing, admin, review fees, you name it. We charge none of that. 
We're cheaper than everyone else. 10.9 is our starting rate for everyone in interest. If you have five deals and over 700 credit score in the last two years, meaning five deals in the last two years and over 700 credit score, we have rates anywhere from 6.9 to 8.9. You just can't be touched right now. Points are two to three points, unless you're sub 600 credit score, then it's four points and a loan doc fee. That's all we charge. If you all take this cell phone number down, it's mine, 512. 417-2348, that is my cell phone. If you have questions tonight for our panel later, 512-417-2348. And if you're watching online, send her a text right now. <laughs> Shoot me a text, add, be sure to add your information. If you want more info, I'm happy to send it to you. More importantly, if you're watching, have questions for any of the speakers or the panel later, be sure to send it to me so I can add it to the list I already got from social media. Perfect. Awesome. So tonight we're going to be focusing on Airbnbs. Does anybody own any short-term rentals? So I call them Airbnbs. It's kind of the going term, um, VRBOs, whatever you want to call them, short-term rentals. So I'm really excited to hear about this because I've been looking at my own along the coastline. I want to kind of buy wherever I want a vacation. So why not have other people pay for it? Seems smart, right? I thought so too. Um, I got it from a client, so I wasn't that smart. But let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, just top performing short sale, or I'm sorry, short term rentals. And uh, well, tell us a little bit about yourself real quick, and then we'll go straight into your presentation. Thank you very much. I'm Julie Kistler, and I'm with Picasa. We are the largest short term property management company in North America. I handle the DFW Metroplex area. So as you can see, that's a very large area. And I personally have managed over 325 private rentals. I was a general manager for a company before I entered the CASA. So I've seen everything and experienced everything. And I can tell you why some homes perform better than others. And so we're just going to kind of um, talk about that a little bit. My contact information is here. You can always reach out to me if you ever need a rental projection, you have a question about a property. We love to talk about short-term rentals. So just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of Dallas County for short-term rentals. I thought this was interesting. Dallas County had more than 100,000 guest arrivals between Memorial Day and Labor, Labor Day, and it brought in $18.5 million more, according to the data provided by Airbnb. So Dallas is a very, very strong market, along with the rest of the country and the world. So property performance. A lot of people ask me, okay, so what should I be looking for in a property? Your number one is location. Walkability is absolutely critical. People are renting Airbnbs for an experience. They want to be close to attractions. They want to be close to being able to experience what the locals are experiencing. So here in the Dallas area, we see a lot of popularity in the Deep Ellum area, the Bishop Arts area, downtown Dallas, all of those places. And we actually do see a lot of staycations. So we do see a lot of local people that are actually renting that are coming from Frisco or whatever it may be. And it's easier to stay here for the weekend. Nearby attractions, you know, you want to be near some attractions, at t Stadium, around Greenville, Lower Greenville, Deep Ellum, any of those places, things that are happening, the American Airlines Center. Um, seasonality. And I see you have to think about properties all over the country of seasonality. There are some homes that have seasonality. There are mountains that have seasonality and beaches, whereas in an urban environment here, we really don't have that much seasonality, but you do have to take that into account when it comes to figuring out your income projections. And how good is the neighborhood? This is really critical. When people drive into the neighborhood, short-term rentals are all about trust. It's all about safety. So how do you feel when you drive into the neighborhood? Do you feel safe? Is it, can you actually stay here? Would you stay here with your family or with your friends? And then always check the regulations in the HOA. This is the biggest thing. These are always ever-changing. Regulations change every day all over the country, all over the world. And then HOAs. You do have to read those bylaws to make sure that it is an option that you can actually make it a uh, short-term rental. And then you also have to be ready for that to change at any time and will it actually pencil out as a long-term rental or can you resell it? So property performance. You definitely want to make sure that it's aesthetically appealing. Your competition is not only your Airbnbs that are around you, but it's also hotels. People are looking for hotel-like quality. They really, really want to have comfortable beds. They want to have comfortable furniture. They want it to be clean. And does it actually hold as much people? So if you have a, one that holds 10 people, do you have seating area for 10 people? It really matters. It's going to make them have a great experience. It's going to give you a better review, and people will come back, and they will tell their friends. Mattresses do 
do matter. Don't skimp on mattresses. Get some nice mattresses so that people, when they're staying there, because the majority of the time, they're not going to be in your home. They're going to be experiencing the lifestyle outside around there, but they are going to be sleeping in the home. And so you have to have great mattresses. And then photos. High quality photos matter. People always select by what they see online. They're not going to really read your description right away. They're going to be reading and looking at your, at your photos. And the platforms, the Airbnbs, the VRBOs, they're all looking for high quality photos too. It does matter. And then if you can do a Matterport or anything of that nature so that people actually can see you know, floor plan, that, ha that matters as well. So occupancy and assets. So I talked to a lot of people about this. The higher occupancy, the better. If you can find a property that you can get more people in, the more money you can command, the more you're going to show up in the search results. So if you can hold 12 people and people are looking for 12, you're going to show up. If people are looking for 10, you're still going to show up, 8, and so forth. So occupancy makes you more money. It gives you the ability to have more and more search results. So when you're thinking about occupancy, bedrooms and bed count. You know, you may have four bedrooms, you may have four beds in there, you could have 10 beds in there. You can also have a sleeper sofa. You can have a lot of creativity when it comes to increasing that occupancy. But when you're doing that, you definitely want to take into consideration the square footage, because you don't want to throw everybody in there like sardines, because they're not going to be happy there, as well as parking. Is there going to be enough parking? And some cities regulate parking that you can only park in the driveways. So you have to take that into consideration. So if you have 16 people, it should be able to park four cars. Um, and then also bathrooms matter. Bathrooms are super critical. If you have 16 people in there and you have two bathrooms, just imagine what people are going to go through and the complaints they're going to have, and they're not going to be very happy. You also want to check your water heaters. So, you know, if you have one water heater and you have 16 people, how many people could take a shower? Believe it or not, that's one of the biggest complaints. So it's just things that you've got to really think about as an actual landlord and a short-term rental. So the top amenities. These are ways that you can actually stand apart from the competition, capture more money, capture more bookings, is pet-friendly. Cannot emphasize pet-friendly enough. People love to travel with their pets. And in the most case, these pets are really well-behaved pets. They don't usually bring their out-of-control pets to a rental. They're usually trying to run away from them if that's the case. So in this case, that's very, very important. Pool tables. Pool tables or gaming tables, foosball, anything, ping pong, anything like that that can make people go, what do we want to stay here, especially if there's a large group and they want to have fun. Um, hot tubs. People love hot tubs, especially in the, in the mountains and in resorts, as well as if you have a romantic property. You can really romance a one bedroom, one bath and really make it special and make some really good money doing that. Um, pools. Some areas, pools are really important. Here in Dallas, the homes that have pools do extremely well. They're, they're racking in the money because it's so hot and people are looking for pools. So just these are the type of things. Grills. There are a lot of properties out here that don't offer a grill. People love to barbecue. They love to get out there with their friends and family and just hang out outside. So just give them a grill. I mean, it's really an expensive investment. And then baby child friendly. People are looking for those pack and plays. They're looking for, can I bring my kid? Is it been, is it been child proofed? Things like that. That can make you stand apart from everybody else. And then handicapped accessible. There's not a lot of them out there. So if you can, if you do have a property, you find what that's handicapped accessible, has the wide doors, anything of that nature. Just imagine if you were to, to advertise that and you were able to be stand apart for the competition and you can get more bookings. And it also makes you friendly. So that is really, really quiet because I really want to make use of your time. But that's really some nuts and bolts about what makes home perform better. So thank you. Thank you. On. So I actually have a question. Sure. You're saying high occupancy is big money, but I also hear big expenses, especially if we're talking pools and hot tubs and things of that nature. Sorry, y'all. My question was, she said that high occupancy is the bigger money maker, but I also hear bigger expenses. How do you determine if where you're going to put your Airbnb, if it makes sense to be a high occupancy unit versus maybe downtown would probably be smaller occupancies? You really have to, so when I look at homes for, for my investors, I look at it from, I use a, three different tools to understand the projection, but then I really go on to Airbnb all around. How many one bedrooms and one baths do I have yeah. right around me that I'm going to compete against? 
If it's saturated, then that's gonna drive my price down. Yeah. If there aren't any four bedrooms, and I can be the only four bedroom, that makes me unique. And so that allows me to be able to command a, lo a little well, bit higher price. it would be easy to run comps. If there is a four or three bedroom and you see it's almost always booked up, because you can see it's calendar, that, that's, uh, you, so you could run your comps. So well, the calendar is a tricky one. Okay. So the calendar, when you go onto Airbnb, you see a teaser price. You open up that teaser price, and it may be eighty-three dollars today because yeah. there was no there's an occupancy and it's today. But if you go three months out down the road or two weeks down the road, you may say two hundred and eighty. You may see three hundred and eighty dollars a night. Okay. So you can't let that teaser happen. You have to really look at the, it in the whole picture okay. and how it all fluctuates back and forth. So you would say go through like a season, like a quarter. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Interesting. Mm -hmm. The other question I had was, um, you know, you mentioned about having them look nice and making them feel very homely. Um, I've seen the Airbnbs that were not, well, short-term rentals, mm -hmm. not to, there, there's VRBO and I like yeah. them a lot, but um, they have been very college dorm. But I also was paying cheaply because I was only there for a night and I need something quick. But I've also stayed at ones where I was afraid to touch anything. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is a dollar per dollar? Like if I put in a hundred extra dollars of decorations that I'm going to recoup that Absolutely. back? The Absolutely. Nice, the nicer it is, the, the better they're going to probably take care of your house, yeah. the more they're going to pay, and you're probably going to get a higher quality. But, you know, there's, it's a give or take, right? You've got to kind of figure out where you're at. You know, yeah. you may be in a mountain community, and it's just a cabin. Yeah. Well, you know, so you have to look at your, you have to look at your audience. Who is your ideal audience? What are they going to actually like? What, do they, what are they looking for, and who do you want to attract? Yeah. And then based upon that, that's how you're going to decorate your property. But definitely declutter depersonalize. You yeah. don't need to have pictures of yourself all over. <laughs> you know, they don't want to see you. That's so, um, those are That's another thing. A lot of people don't want to do that. Yeah. But, they, but they, you definitely need to do that. Interesting. So. Does anyone have questions for Julie? So I'm one of your tools. So I, I have a lot of investors call me every day, all the time, ask me for projections. So I have tools with Picasa. But then I also use I also use other tools, AirDNAs, Mash Visors. I spend all my days on Airbnb, Verbo, just understanding what the competition is around there, looking, understanding their calendars, what's going on, how you can monopolize that that area, how can you stand apart doing those things. So it's really just looking at it as truly like a, if you were to run a comp a CMA for a property that you're looking at, that's exactly actually how I look at it through a true real estate perspective. And I also look at the cap rates and the cash flows, right? So the cap rates, there are properties here that do not work. They just don't. And, you know, if, if I can't make that cap rate work, I will tell the, the investor, no, this, this is not, this isn't working. It's better off being a long term, right? Just because there are some places that don't perform that they should. And that's the way you have Would to you go. say it's too deep in a neighborhood or what are the triggers that someone might too notice? Too deep that? in a neighborhood. There's nothing around it. There's, it's just... They can get a higher price on their rental because okay. it's it's in demand for a family yeah. or somebody that's looking to stay there for a long time. So you mentioned pet friendly is yes. numero uno. Do you have advice for how to mitigate having pets at the house? What if they're not a good pet or a puppy? Do you, you ask, ask for a pet fee? Do you, what do you think is reasonable? Every host is a little bit different. We offer we ask for a pet fee, but you should also screen. You can always also ask. You know, what is your, tell me a little bit more about your pet. You can, you can limit it to one pet under 25 pounds. You can limit it to two pets under 25 pounds. You can put limits of however you like. You can say no pets but dogs. No cats allowed and nothing. I mean, you know, we don't allow cats. And one time somebody brought a pig, you know, a thousand pound pig. We don't allow pigs. And that's not a made up story. That's the truth. So you definitely do need to kind of limit what you prefer. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, good info. Anyone else have questions? Well, the net depends on what the gross is. So, he's asking. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm yelling. He's asking, what is the average net ROI, or sorry, ROI on your net? Um, but I would think that's like any investment. It probably depends on the metrics of the deal. Are you in a two hundred thousand dollar house that you can rent out nightly for a hundred dollars, and it's fifty percent mm -hmm. occupied through the year? I mean, I think it's probably going to depend on what you're looking at. A good rule of thumb is 220 days out of the year that you should be rented out. 
and then based upon your nightly rent, we don't usually use nightly rent, we usually use annual revenue. So, so good rule of thumb is 220 days out of the year. I would say, you know, here in Dallas, it can fluctuate anywhere from, anywhere from $69 a night all the way up to $1,000 a night, depending on which home you're speaking about. So what, however size it is, is what I can give you. But when it comes down to gross and your expenses, you're probably looking at anywhere from 25 to 31% is what your expenses will be off the top of your gross. Hopefully that helps with all... Seventy to seventy-five percent. It should be your net. Yes. After all of your expenses, that's how our company is annually. That's correct. Two hundred and twenty days is a lot of days. It really is. It really that's is. That's a lot of days. Here in Dallas, uh, that actually surprises me. Dallas, we have really good occupancy in some areas. We can go all the way up to seventy-five percent. It just depends. We don't really have seasonality here. Yeah. Because we just continuously churn vis visitors over and over. And so we actually have a better, better occupancy rate than some other areas. But use that good rule of thumb. Uh, what's your average uh, uh, house per bed for realtor per, uh, what's the nice average for realtor per bed? I would do three bedroom, two bath it would be the minimum is what I would do. Because you're going to get more people, you're going to have a nice bathroom. If you go up to four bedrooms, I would try to get three baths. Ideally, it would be bath matches bedroom. So if you have a 2-2, two, two, you want a 2-2. Two, two. Three, 3-3, three, that would be ideal. Or if you can even have an extra half bath, would be ideal. Awesome. Well, we're going to move on to our next guest. If you have Thank more you questions, much. save them on for later for the panel, and we'll happily get those out. Thank you, Julie. Thank that you. was Thank 220 you. days blows my mind. Yeah. I appreciate Thank it. You. So, Thank you. Next, we have Jason. Jason has been training real estate investors for 17 years, and he has trained over 20,000 investors, basically teaching them how to go in and kill the market. So let's have Jason come and join us. Hey, folks. How are you? We're doing well? Uh, show of hands. Anybody in the room want to make more money than just beyond just regular booking, stuff like that? Show of hands. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just give you some things here in a short amount of time that you need to think about that will actually cause you to make a decision to buy a property versus pass on one. Would that help everybody out? Is that fair? So, uh, so I'm just going to walk you through some of that stuff. So it's maximizing your income potential. Uh, several of you here, like I said, I just showed up yesterday. Networking out there, they, uh, uh, I've been doing this for 20 years uh, for some of the big companies, some of the ones you know, big training companies, TV shows on this and that, lead generation, and uh, I've fallen in love with Airbnb. So uh, I'm going to walk you through some of this tonight. My wife runs this like an absolute pro, and um, so she's put together a, a complete Airbnb investment blueprint, and this is just one section of what we have, and I'll give you some information at the end. Uh, hey. Um, I'll give you information at the end to uh, grab some of the stuff. I'll, I'll show you some waivers. But we're going to talk about maximizing your, your income potential just beyond the regular booking. Fair enough? Cool? Okay, so here we go. If I can get it to move. Here, give me a second. No, it's all right. I just can't get the clicker to work. Oh, it's not working? No, it wasn't a second ago. You just got point clicker? Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's talk about um, going beyond just the daily rate, okay? So you can obviously just set a daily rate uh, and a strong suggestion for everybody if you want to take a note. Uh, there's going to be websites that help you host your property so that you get eyeballs on it, right, so that you get bookings. They have, they have things in place that once you put it up there that they give you a suggested daily rate. Can I just tell everybody, just make a mental note. Just use it as a guideline. Don't use it as a gospel setting. Does that make sense? And I'll give you an example in a second because uh, I was going to be here with my wife doing it, but she stayed home because we just went live with the property. 
And while we were in Cabo, she goes, I just went live for fun, and it was booked out for two and a half months already. So she's like, oop, I better get it ready really fast, right? But on the daily rate, so most just said a daily rate, book it, and forget it. So here's what you need to do. Um, there's other analytics and resources like AirDNA and MashVisor. Who's, who's never been to AirDNA or MashVisor? Raise your hand. Okay, so about half of this room. So what these two sites do is this. They break down the numbers, and what I want you to get in the habit of doing is this. Uh, when you're identifying a property that you, that you are looking at to uh, not just use for a cash-flowing machine, but you're really drilling down on the numbers to, to drill down what you want to offer on a property, and is this one going to make sense for you? Use AirDNA or MashVisor because what they do is they take all of the properties in the area um, that are up for Airbnb, and they, they break it down not just by properties in the area, but by bedroom count by sleep count. Does everybody understand the power of that? Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, what you want to do is break down how many, how many people can sleep there, right? So these particular sites do that. They give you daily rates. So the, the beauty of this is, is that if you're identifying a property and you use these to do your research, here's what happens, okay? So here's what happens. They'll break down what an average daily rate is for the same type of property that you're doing. It's not just all the properties in the area. So you could say, I have a three bedroom and it sleeps eight. So you can compare it with the click of a button to three bedroom sleeps eight. You understand the power of that, right? And um, so it'll give you a real benchmark. And so I, I, I always equate it. I tell everybody, I'm like, look, things like this in place, I love, I love Airbnb versus re traditional renting because it's like three to four times the rent potentially if you, if you pick the right one. But these break down for you. It's almost cheating. Uh, going in, knowing exactly whether you should buy it or not, wh what to make an offer on based upon real data. Is everybody feeling that? Understand that? So it isn't just, hey, this is similar bedroom account, or here's all the property in the area, and it gives you an average daily rate. You can click a button and say, okay, three bedroom, sleeps eight, just like mine's going to sleep. Okay, now it just did the average daily rate from 179 to 225. At 225, this house makes sense. It's a no-brainer. I'm going to buy this property. Does everybody get that? Okay. So uh, one thing that you want to do is... Um, Here's, here's, a, here's a hack for you. So once you get the ball rolling and you start getting properties, here's a hack for you on the average daily rate. You're going to set a daily rate as a benchmark for yourself, uh, for your property. But one thing that all these websites that are going to host your property so you can get a bunch of eyeballs on it, one thing that they, that they do that they like their algorithms when people are searching is that if you dynamically change the rates, you get a higher booking rate. Does everybody understand what that means? What that means is this. So if you're taking a note, it means this. Once you get your site live, I would do, here, here's the huge note, underline it, circle it. Um, this is where we're teaching you to make more money. What you need to do is set a reoccurring appointment on your calendar. So if you want to take a note, say, set a reoccurring appointment on my calendar to change the daily rates. Whether you change it by a dollar, ten dollars, fifteen dollars, ten, that's inconsequential, right? It's not much, but these these booking sites see that you're active, and when you're active and people search in your zip codes, guess who shows up first? You do. Does that make sense? So this is a way to start maximizing your revenue and get more eyeballs on your stuff. So don't just set a rate just because a website um, suggests it for you and just not think about it and forget it. Go in there, set a recurring appointment on your calendar that says, "Hey, change the daily rate." So you just go in and change the daily rate a little bit, and you start showing up first, right? It's a technique to show up first when people search in that zip code because I'm assuming that you want everybody to put their eyeballs on your property first. Make sense to everybody? Understand? Okay. Another thing that you want to do is uh, festivals, events. So anything that's a specialty thing. So uh, events, concerts, holiday sports, like here in Dallas, uh, as an example, I'm certain like football right? So you're going to, you guys understand that if your average daily rate that you just have published out there for somebody to book, once it's football season, you understand that you can go up to a, an extra 100 to 150 a night. Who, do, who doesn't understand that, right? Same thing with concerts, events, festivals. As, as an example, we have one in St. Louis where I used to live. I live in uh, Tampa now. Uh, St. Louis Cardinals, St. Louis, it's, it, opening day is like it's, it's almost like a holiday. Most businesses shut down in St. Louis, and it's a huge party. So we can charge tri double, almost triple the, the average daily rate for that week before and that week after. Does that make sense? You can get, you can get a average full month's revenue in a matter of two weeks. And my wife goes in and tweaks that stuff like a ninja. So what you can't do is set it and forget it because you cost yourself 
easily, depending on the property in the area, an extra three to five. Who would just like an extra three to five grand a year because you spend one minute, one minute every two weeks just tweaking a daily rate? There's no thought. Think about this. There's no thought process involved. You, it pops up on your calendar. You're like, okay, I'm simply just going to change the rate. And you show up, you start showing up faster. Does everybody get that? Okay. So concerts, holidays, sports, convention centers equal higher rates. Uh, and then on a slow month, drop the daily rate. So as it gets, here's, here's the other technique. And if you set a reminder on your calendar, you won't forget to do it. You can, you can change the daily rate for next month, two weeks from now, or this calendar week that's coming up. If your property isn't booked and you're two weeks out, drop the rate. So if your rate is 150, drop it down to 90, 99 bucks, 89.9. Everybody get that? Because there's people searching right now that are looking for a place. And if all of a sudden you just simply in 60 seconds change yours because you simply want to fill it for these dates that are coming up, you may, you may all of a sudden fill it with $400 in revenue over the next two weeks where you had nothing on the books. Everybody get that? Um, so that's a technique to do it. So all you have to do is get a property, set a reoccurring appointment on your calendar, knowing that it pops up saying, hey, change the daily rate or adjust it, and you guys will make more revenue. Uh, just metrics for you, the one that we have in uh, St. Charles, near Saint, it's a suburb of St. Louis. Uh, we started out, and halfway through the year, we had 20-something 20 20 grand in booking. We started tweaking it. We ended the year at 58 grand. Starting to make sense now? Uh, that's simply just due to changing the rates and then special events around it. We, we charge more because people are willing to pay it. Everybody get that? Cool. The next is price by sleep count or be not bed count. Okay. So price by sleep count, not the bed count. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter if you have a three bedroom and you have three bed there. Can you have a pull out couch? Yes. Can you have a futon? Yes. One, one thing to write down is um, in the closet, put an air mattress. Because people ask you, hey, is there any way we could squeeze two more people in there? Hey, look, if you want to pay an extra $60 a night, because they get to converse with you. Okay? Does everybody get They get to converse with you. Yeah, for an extra 60 bucks a night, we, we actually have an air mattress you can pull down, and we'll, we'll allow two more people to stay. Does everybody get that? So it's all about sleep count. How many people can you get to sleep in that property? Okay? Uh, the one in St. Charles, uh, we had a private office behind a uh, hidden bookshelf. And it hurt a little bit when we moved out, but I ripped all that out, which really hurt me. But we added two more bedrooms, and it didn't hurt anymore. Okay? We, we added, literally, we added another four sleep spaces, and the hurt went away. Okay? So it's about how many can you sleep in that particular property. So um, maximize by the number of people that can sleep there. Pull out bed. Blow up mattress. Add verbiage to your listing that allows for extra guests. People don't know. Here's a tip, and you might want to write this down and circle it. People don't know that you'll allow extra guests to stay there beyond what's published. All they have to do is ask. So they don't know that unless you put it in there. Hey, if you'd like to sleep extra people, we can potentially accommodate it. Just send us a message. It's up to you, though. Everybody good with that? Okay. Question? Yes. Uh, so his question is stealing stuff through Airbnb. Uh, we haven't experienced that yet. You will have stuff that's broken. People, people are coming and going, but we haven't really experienced anything. I would simply say this. If you're going to Airbnb something, please don't put a family heirloom hanging on the wall that looks sexy and attractive, okay? It's human nature. People are like, oh, it's sticky. It's stuck to my arm. I had to take it with me, right? So um, uh, we really haven't experienced that much, but, but these booking sites give you insurance coverage, right, because they get 10% of your booking fee. So a lot of them will give you coverage on things that happen and uh, lost items. You just need to read the fine print. But we haven't really dealt with that much, okay? hasn't really been an issue. Yeah, no problem. Uh, become pet friendly. I think I heard the previous person here speaking about that, right? So uh, become pet friendly because you can make extra money. So... Here's the, here's the cool part. You can choose the kind of pet. Uh, anybody here want to put on their listing that they allow boa constrictors? Probably not. Okay? Uh, but you can allow a dog, a cat, whatever you're comfortable with, the size, the type of breed, and you can charge extra money. Uh, I think this, this past calendar 12-month cycle, uh, uh, just uh, off the top of my head, thinking off of two of our properties, we made an extra 2500 in revenue just because we allowed a small pet of 30, 30 pounds or less. 
Who would like to make an extra three grand by having bookings and you charge X amount? Here's the other cool thing. You can also up the cleaning fee because they had a pet there. And, and these people who love their pets, do you think they're going to – raise your hand if you think they will bat an eye. They won't bat an eye, right? Hey, the cleaning fee goes from 140 to 165 Everybody get that? Okay. So this is – what we're talking about right now is extra revenue streams inside the properties that you do if you, if you position this correctly, okay? And uh, the next one is bike rental. Here's another way to make money uh, on the one that we just went live on uh, down near St. Pete Beach in Florida right now. My wife just got a, a bike uh, for 25 bucks. So just went on Craigslist, got a bike. We're going to offer bike rental. And 10 bucks a day, $15 a day times a seven-day stay, especially if you're close to places that they can ride to because we bought this one that's within one mile of the beach. Do you guys get that game? Do you see what we're doing there? Uh, times seven days. That's just one stay. That pays for the <laughs> that pays for the bike in two days. Yeah, does that work for you? Okay, good. And uh, so you could charge a flat rate. You can do a charge per day. And uh, and if anybody wants an, a liability waiver, you can email my wife. So uh, you might want to write this down. Just say, hey, I need a bike waiver. You you definitely want them to sign a waiver because if they use your bike, and you don't have a waiver signed and they hurt themselves, then they'll try and hold you responsible, right? So you can email my wife, allyjess at gmail.com, and she will just ask her for a bike waiver. Is that cool? Does that help everybody? Okay. But this is a way, yet again, uh, your listings with all these things available that I'm talking to you about right now, per stay, you can make an extra 100, 150 bucks. And if you add that times 50, 60 stays a year, do you, do you see how the all of a sudden uh, the revenue potential starts to skyrocket and go through the roof? Make sense? Yeah, the little things that add up. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And then here's one. Become an, become an affiliate for amenities. Okay? So provide a welcome book. You enter this space, it's a huge mistake for you not to have a welcome book. The welcome book tells them that you're going you're gonna to take headache phone calls. You, don't, you can't afford a bad review. If somebody, Ryan or Ron, you come and stay and you can't connect to the Internet, you're going to call me, aren't you? Right? Well, shouldn't your book say that right out? Hey, right out of the gate, it's this. Hey, it's uh, Twinkies and the and the whatever is Twinkies, right? It, the password is Twinkies. They can't think that. So, what you want to do is strike a deal with them to, with your local businesses to get traffic. You can do, you can be a preferred vendor uh, for guests coming to town. Preferred vendor, and they'll give you money for that. Uh, code for guests to to maintain uh, to get their credit increase for your business referral partners. Shuttle services, restaurants, mini golf, you can get discounts for that and also make money off of that stuff. Does that make sense? You simply just ask them. I always tell people, turn this into block out one hour, talk to all the local places that you're going to put in your book anyways. Hey, if I bring clients to you, can we make money? Yeah. Makes sense. Cleaning fees. So, your person charges you 100 bucks. You publish it for 135. You make an extra 35 dollars per stay. Everybody get that? Check in and check out times, and then we'll finish up. Check in and check out. If somebody wants an early check in, 50 bucks. If somebody wants a late check out, 20 bucks. They will not blink an eye. Um, would you rather stay in a house with all the amenities or a hotel? Probably a house. Make sense? I would think you have to think about who your client is. If you're a house that's family oriented and you have a pool on the coast of Tampa, they probably want to check in early because they've landed early and they have kids that need to have a nap and 3 p.m. check-in is not Correct. ideal. Correct. So I, I would think it depends. And then lastly, if you want more information on it, like I said, you want a waiver, you can email Jess. You can, uh, you can go to her Facebook group, Airbnb Investment, and if you want to see, we built out operational maps to run the entire business for you. So if you need help, you just let us know, reach out to us, and uh, we're more than happy to help you. But you can make extra revenue 
well beyond your normal booking fees if you start to do this and pay attention to these little details. So hopefully that helps everybody out and helps you make an extra five to 10 grand per calendar year per property. Sound good? Okay. Okay, folks. So all of that seemed really, really simple. Like, why didn't I think of that? I Correct. do have a question though. Yeah. You know, they say in marketing, make something 99, 499, 999, mm -hmm. 199, whatever. Do you think that there's benefit to that? So if the rest of the market is 150 a night, do you think there's benefit to being 149 a night because yeah. people might be searching 150 or less? Absolutely. So knock down, that's paying attention to your day, right? See what the, see what the, your competitors are doing. And if you apply all these other skill sets, you see how much more money you can make and you really don't even care that much about the daily rate. Example, if everybody's 150, why not do 139.9? You will get a ton of traffic and your cleaning fee is 135. You've already made up that $10 discount, $11 discount. Does everybody get that? That's a technique. That's something that if you pay attention to, you can get all the bookings and all the eyeballs. So very good question. Yeah. That's actually, that was good. I like that. Because we often, how many of you have often said when you're putting a flipper rental, I'm going to undercut the market so it sells quick and it works? Uh, I, why not do it here? That's fantastic. I did have one other quick question for you, though. Yes. Um, you were talking about occupancy, having, uh, you know, inflatable beds available for people, you know, Correct. can we accommodate more? At what point do you start to question bunk beds, whether there's <laughs> too many or too few? Um, yeah, so you just want to, it's, it's a feel for property. What I would tell you is this, and um, so I'll, I'll approach it from a different manner here, okay? Uh, just don't squeeze, hey, we can sleep 18 people in this 700 square feet. Because I've seen yeah. those. Where it's like we see 20 yeah, and they have no, like just 18 bunk beds. <laughs> have it make sense. Usually, usually um, 7 to 10 is a good size group or a family coming in. That's why they want to stay with you because they'd have to get three to four hotel rooms and pay 600 a night. So your two, 250 a night uh, is attractive to them, right? But you can offer to, like I said, have air mattresses and on make an exception for it. What you would do is you would look at their reviews. Do not ignore people's reviews. If somebody's gonna book with you and they don't have any reviews or any profile up, and they say, hey, we're gonna have 12 people, and your maximum number, you may, wanna, you may wanna take a step back on that, especially if it's New Year's Eve, because they're gonna have a party. Everybody get that? If it's uh, spring break, like right now, we're booking right now in Florida, and people are coming down like, spring break! We're like. We, we, had, we had a guy, he's like, I'm 21, people are not going to, and we're like, yeah, no, not a chance. It's just me and six of my friends. Bless his heart. <laughs> and no. <laughs> yeah, everybody here who's had young kid or kids or grown up, they know that the answer's no, right? I love it. So, uh, I mean, we were talking about earlier with Julie, the uh, bed and bath mix. Do you think that adding on bunk beds and, uh, you know, potential cots or things like that, do you need to start thinking about adding half baths? Um, yeah, you can add a half bath and it'll help out with your booking rate, but um, it's it's mostly about sleep count. Okay. okay. I mean, it makes sense. It makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah, it's, so it's mostly about sleep count. Well, does anyone have a last question for Jason before we move on? Uh, question back there. Go ahead, man. Uh, we do both. Um, so we use other people's properties and, um, and strike deals with them, and we also buy properties as well. One final tip I'll say is this. You guys want to get a property cheaper and explode the ROI? Um, when people come to stay at your Airbnb, do they, Daniel knows me well, I trained him a long time ago. Do they give a crap about a garage? Can you, can you look for two ones instead of three bedrooms with a garage or three four bedrooms? Can you get a two one, a hundred grand cheaper and then convert that garage into two bedrooms with a Jack and Jill bathroom? Ooh, hmm. That's a good tip. You might want to write that down. Look at two ones and convert. Nobody gives a shit about the garage. Is that fair? Because most people, they either don't have a car or it's a rental. I would think. Do you guys get that? Awesome. You could, <laughs> bedroom count, sleep count. Sleep count. Okay? Awesome. I love it. Okay, folks. Thank you so much. That was great info. See you guys. So are you guys taking away some good information here? How many have written down notes or taken screenshots of the screen? Yeah, true story. I've do it too. <laughs> I love it. Great. So we have George Sells coming up. He's come to us all the way from Houston. Uh, so George, I actually know. Um, he's a client of mine that was flipping 
and recently decided to move into the Airbnb space and has murdered it. He's doing, I think he has 34 properties now. So we're going to give the stage to George. He's going to have uh, quite a bit of time. He's just 45 minutes. So he's going to talk to you quite a bit. If you have questions and it seems appropriate during the, the speech, or sorry, the whatever you want to call it, presentation, be sure to uh, raise your hand. But if we don't get to you, just bear in mind we can get questions at the end. Or again, we're going to have a panel later, and that's going to be a great time. Or text me your questions, and I'll ask them. This is live on YouTube. Hi, y'all. Thank you for watching. We had over 60 people watching a few minutes ago. So you can always re-watch, tag one of us, and we are always happy to come back and answer the questions. George, you ready? Come on up. What's up, Houston? Oh, I almost said Houston. What's up, Dallas? How are you? Well, let's set this up real quick. All right. So... Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Daniel and the entire Propelio team. Kelly is a good friend of mine. And I've, when I started real estate about a year and a half ago, uh, actually, I was very excited working with Kelly. So she has helped me get to where I'm at right now and I appreciate all the love and everything she has done for us while um, when we started flipping and uh, doing a couple of the deals on our first, uh, say, 2018. So about February, just to break it down for you guys. Um, a little bit uh, of myself, I'm 35, just turned 35, uh, I was born in a small town in Peru, very small, and I moved here when I was uh, 15 years old, all right? Uh, I grew up in an adobe house, so I come from absolutely nothing, moved to the United States in 99, um, didn't speak any English for you, uh, I was an event promoter from 2007 to 17, so I hosted over a thousand events, so I used to have a big crowd, but never on stage, I was always the guy behind the scenes putting it all together. Okay, so we opened a, a $1.4 million nightclub in 2016, and I had saved for quite a bit of time. I didn't know anything about real estate. I had no idea what, uh, what it was to run a business three years ago, absolutely nothing. Okay, so started learning. We lost it all, first of all, uh, because of no knowledge of business. I didn't protect myself enough, so I ended up uh, making some bad decisions as an investor. I wasn't the operator, but... Uh, I wasn't prepared, didn't have the right documentation, so I lost everything, all right? So right after that, I decided that I wanted to change my life and switch to real estate or find something awesome, something that was going to give me the opportunity to actually make something out of myself, all right? So, and that was real estate, and uh, I, I give it to one of my buddies, Brent Franklin. Uh, he was one of the first people that actually inspired me to be in real estate and Due to all of the encouragement that he gave me, I went ahead and took the journey, right? So I got the first deal in 2018, February. So between 18 of that time up till the end of uh, the first year, which is 20 December, I did 12 wholesale deals, 12 flips, and I turned one of those flips into an owner finance. Okay, so I rehabbed it, then we exited that way. All without knowing a freaking damn thing less than six months ago. So... I did make a couple mistakes, you know, and um, I lost some two of my flips, but that's okay. So everybody falls down, so you just got to learn how to pick yourself up and, and very strongly and then just keep going, right? So started with two Airbnbs in Montrose and then eight downtown. Here's the story. I actually took my wholesale fees from that July of 18, and I started my two Airbnbs. I did not know Actually, the first eight I had under contract, all right? And I had no idea how I was going to fund them. I just knew that I had three wholesale deals closing that month, okay? So then uh, I had a little bit of extra cash for the other two. Then we launched those two Airbnbs in July, and we were waiting for the other eight in downtown Houston for the renovations to take place, all right? So uh, the landlord, these are arbitrage leases that we uh, that we picked up, that I picked up, and uh, the landlord was actually renovating them right across the street from the Toyota Center, all right? So uh, 22 months, uh, we've done 40 real estate deals, including a few subject twos, uh, uh, 34 listed Airbnbs, on all the wholesale deals as flips and above. So I don't know how the heck I did it, but we're still here, right? Uh, so 30 of those are Rental arbitrage and four that I, I own. We are actually in the process of refinancing two of them. We've refinanced two already. 
Uh, we actually, one of those we purchased is a subject to, I'll talk about it a little bit later um, during the presentation, all right? So, and right now, I focus on the growth, uh, building the system, so it, between a year and a half ago when we started, and right now, we have, uh, we started actually just like everybody else, right? You take your first step and uh, actually don't know what you're doing, you make the mistakes, you lose a little bit of money, you keep going, and then you learn as you go, right? At least I was in hospitality for 10 years, so I knew exactly what I was doing as far as taking care of the customers, right? The, the guests, the clients. So, uh, and as we built, I, I had no processes, no systems, no softwares. We didn't utilize any of that stuff, right? So we did it all manually as I was doing the flips and as I was wholesaling and as I was really trying to figure out what my niche was going to be in real estate, right? I was just trying to do it, and um, it just happened to land on this, and I'm blessed to be here today. So let's go to the next slide real quick. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, we're going to go a little bit deep, all right? I'm not going to tell you how to start a business. I'm not going to tell you steps of what you, the, the steps you need to take. I'm going to go and tell you how you can find this Airbnbs with 10 different ways, right? You, some of the ways are going to be with no money. Uh, a couple of other ones are going to be as a rental arbitrage, so leasing the property from somebody else. And the other ones will be, uh, purchasing ownership, just and it. So this is for pretty much all ages and anyone who would love to start an Airbnb business, uh, which which is a pretty pretty luxurious, but it is a lot of work. So I'm not trying to tell you here that you are going to go and make millions and not have to work. Um, it is very very difficult and hard, and you have to work your asses off. All right. So just like anything else in life, it just it doesn't come easy, but. It could be luxurious. You can make good money. And what I'm doing here is building a team. And, and I want to show you guys a lot of the love and tell you how this journey happened, tell you some of the awesome strategies that I utilize because of the acquisition skills and uh, I guess the personality and being able to build those relationships, how we found and were able to make it happen to 34 properties today, right? All right, let's get into the good stuff. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you? So Airbnb, it's an awesome platform, right? It's, it's crazy. There's a guy that came up with it 12 years ago. His name is Brian Chesky, all right? And uh, his company is now worth $31 billion. Can you believe that? Uh, 12 years ago, they've, they've bought 21 companies, and their revenue last year was insane, $96 million in, million dollars in profit in 18, and $2 billion, and they're expected to do for 3.8 billion this year, which is insane, which is crazy. It is the fastest growing industry. I see Airbnb everywhere, and, and I'm happy to be here in, in this actual industry. So I want you guys also to not be afraid and, and take that step, you know, take that leap of faith, no matter where you are in your lives. Because y if you just doubt that one step you want to take, you don't know where it's going to take you. One step, one decision one skill, one person you meet could change your life or your business forever. All right? So the three models are going to be co-hosting slash management. All right? That's your first one. You can do that one completely free. You simply just have to have hustle and, and guts and be go meet people and, and just message. You just have to hustle, right? You can do that one without a dollar. Nothing, right? So no experience needed. It doesn't cost you anything. You can literally just go learn it on YouTube. And soon, before I forget, you can learn it on Propelio Academy very, very soon. All right? Uh, let me get out of the way here. Uh, the second model is the arbitrage model where arbitrage is actually the difference between your 
gross and in your rent and expenses. That's what arbitrage is. Simply in just very simple words, uh, you don't have to own the property. Uh, and, and if you go rent it from somebody else, it can literally cost you $5,000. And when I got started, I started with C-class apartments. Those two that I told you about in Montrose, Houston, as well as the other eight. They're C-class in a great location. So it makes them C-class because they're one is a 32 unit. And the 32 unit doesn't have many amenities. The other one is a 25 unit. They're older apartments. But it doesn't matter that they're old. They're not A-class and they don't have all the pools. and what It doesn't matter. They make money. And then they might not make as money as other properties, but I'm going to tell you when I break it down for you how you can kind of change that up a little bit and how much money you can actually make, all right? Are you ready for the good stuff? Yeah. All right. Uh, the third model is the ownership model. That's where uh, we're transitioning to, right? And that's where everybody, that's the dream of most of us right here. That we want to build an awesome portfolio, own properties, and, and just live the life of our dreams, that's what I'm working on, and that's what I want you guys to keep your asses working on as well, all right? Uh, where, where you, when you buy, um, obviously, I'm sure everybody knows, but I love to repeat this. You get more benefits than anything else, right? So if I could buy every single property in Airbnb, it, I really would. Now, I want you guys to do that, so now we can do it together, all right? So uh, first of all, the cash flow is is the benefit number one, right? Then you're going to get depreciation and depreciation and then the equity. Equity equity is like the back end. You don't get it until you sell it, right? And then your depreciation, you can write off your taxes. Simon, what's up, brother? Anyway, uh, so those are the three models. And um, I'm happy to tell you all about the three. You do need a certain amount of uh, money to invest in uh, the arbitrage model. So uh, just a quick example, we just staged one property that we purchased um, in Hockley, Texas, which I'll talk about a little bit after. Uh, this one cost us 13 grand, and we bought it for 5,100. It's a subject to it. I'll tell you how we bought it in just a minute when we go over everything else. Uh, which So $18,000 of a furnished Airbnb, four bedroom, now making uh, you know anywhere between 25 and 3,500 dollars to start off because it's got to warm up. And then the market is is the only Airbnb in Hockley. I am scared, all right? It's the only Airbnb in Hockley, Texas. And we have another one that's very close in Cypress, Texas as well, okay? So today, these are the 10 steps that I want you to take. So whenever you are anywhere and you're like, you, you just want to find an Airbnb or whenever you're ready to do it, these are the 10 steps I take, and I'll break them down for you, all right? And the... Step number one is picking the area, your zip code, right? Number one, how do you do that? Anybody know? Okay. You go to AirDNA, which is the probably the best software. It tells you the occupancy of that property or the area. It takes the average of 12, maybe 8 to 12 properties in that zip code, and it tells you where where they're occupied, how much they're occupied. It tells you what they're bringing in as an average. And it takes the amount of days that they're booked and, and averages the amount of days, the revenue versus the amount of days that are booked. That, and then also the, 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 the amount that they're booked, which gives you the daily, the average daily rate, right? So that's one. Step number two, you're going to analyze that property and those numbers. You're going to put them into spreadsheet, which I'm going to show you also later. All right, and, and that's how you're going to get some of these numbers. Step number three, uh, you're going to research and figure out which ones are the top performing properties. So find your comps, just like when, you, when you're trying to find a property that you're going to wholesale or you're going to buy to flip or, or BRRRR, whatever you're doing, right? Owner finance, whatever you're doing, find your comps. And how are you going to find your comps and, and actually make sure that they – are the top performing, you see the numbers, you look at the photos, you look at the listing, what's the quality, what are the reviews, now you're running comps. So that's your third step, all right? So by then, you should already know if you want to be in that market or not because you take a percentage, about 30 to 40% of your gross. For someone like myself, I've got a company, I've got 10 employees, and I have uh, a lot of softwares that we use. 
we buy supplies in bulk. We have storage rooms. We have an office. Recently, we got our first office. I'm blessed to say, never had an office before, and it feels really awesome to have an office. So I'm just excited, guys. <laughs> Step number four, uh, I compare my ADR, and I just run my numbers, and I'm like, okay, is this going to make sense? So am I going to make money? Okay, just a glance. We, we haven't done, and as we're doing this, we're actually putting it into the spreadsheet, which I'll also show you. Uh, when we go into the spreadsheet, all right? Uh, number five, you calculate the taxes. You go to your age cat if you're going to buy. If you're not going to buy, um, you don't do that. You just take the rent, right? You're going to have to calculate your insurance and all those expenses, uh, which is th the next step after number six. So calculate your taxes. You calculate your PITI if you're going to buy or your rent if you're going to rent, right? Um, your gross annual revenue, and then you're going to take the expenses and I know it might sound a little crazy, but when you see a spreadsheet and how you put it, it literally takes to you. It, it might take you 30 to 45 minutes to do the entire thing. So it, it sounds like, oh, my God, I don't know what to do. But you got to know your numbers. Even when you, you know, when you do a wholesale deal, you got to know your numbers. When you do a flip, you got to know your numbers. You got to know your numbers when you do Airbnb. And I'm going to tell you one secret. Don't tell anyone. I actually... I had faith, and I had no idea that this existed. I didn't know what I was doing, and I just went ahead and got the properties without knowing that they were going to cash flow what they cash flow me today, but I knew they were downtown. So now you have the opportunity to learn the websites that, that you can utilize, the softwares with the spreadsheet, what it looks like, what items are in that sheet that you can work on create and analyze uh, so that your property, you, you, you realize if your property is going to make you money. All right? Uh, so, and then you take massive action if, if it makes sense, of course. All right? So, strategy number one, um, partner with an apartment owner. Um, I've actually partnered, but I've rented from the apartment owner. And today, apartment owners that are my friends or that I've met, actually, there's a gentleman in Dallas that I, that I met, and uh, he wants me to pick up his properties, right? So they will call you if they know that you are the Airbnb person. They will offer you properties. They do that to me. And I, I at first partnered in a way that I started renting the properties from the apartment owner. That's also a partnership, right? So the way that I'm speaking here is... You're going to partner in a way that if this apartment owner is an Airbnb, is, is an actual, uh, not an Airbnb host, but is a, uh, an investor, right? And, and he knows about this strategy, and uh, you can approach the investor slash apartment owner to partner with you in a sense that he's going to furnish the units, and you're going to manage them for him. All right? Go ahead. No, 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 no. No, he does not own, I, I do not own any of the apartment buildings. So let's just say you own an apartment, it's 20 units, all right? Most single owners, and he's not at 100% occupied. He's 90%. He has two units that are open. And he's looking for someone to come in and take those units. And he might not be occupied, or the rent might be too high, his mortgage, his loan, whatever. There is people out there, I guarantee you. I promise you because I did it. He's going to, if you know him and you build a relationship and you ask him to partner, hey, do you want to do Airbnb? Everybody wants to do Airbnb. Trust me, everyone, because it gives you more cash flow. Now, do they want to run it? No. Do they want to go find it or go stage it or manage it or do whatever? No. They just want to do Airbnb because they want the bigger, higher returns. That's why everybody wants to do Airbnb. But what gets you there is a lot of work, right? And you can do it for him for whatever percentage you negotiate. Okay, so apartments are everywhere. Um, you need a phone and you need, a, you, need, you need to have a lot of hustle. That's it, right? Um, you're going to build relationships with apartment owners like I have and you can get these properties. You can help this owner that is a small-time owner, not a big-time owner, right, um, a management company that owns a 100-unit. Actually, they can also call you and ask you to rent their properties, but I doubt they'll want to put 
$5,000 in staging costs, right? And if they do, good for you. You just found a gold mine because they staged the entire property for you, and now you're managing it for a percentage, and you didn't put a dollar. All right, so strategy number two, partner with another Airbnb host, and I suggest someone that has a couple properties, three, four, five. You know why? Because this guy either has a full-time job, is has a full-time wholesaling company, is a full-time luxury real estate agent, and he's just doing this part-time, and they don't want the headache. So you're gonna approach these guys through Airbnb, you can approach them through meetups, Facebook groups, they're all out there. And I'm actually looking for a host to come help because we're growing crazy, right? So everyone needs some type of help. And if they're managing, some people are not made to manage, right? They're not made to be on the phone. I'm not. I did it and I know what it takes, right? I'm not. I hire a team and I have departments. So one person takes care of two departments, the other one takes care of two more, the other one takes care of two more. I have three lead managers, l leader managers, and then, then, then I'm also bringing on board a, an execution slash operations person to, to help me take over the headaches because it's too many, right? And it's good, good headaches. You're making money. Those are good headaches. I'm down for them. So groups, workshops, there's tons of workshops nowadays. I mean, they're... Uh, probably one every week, one a couple every month. I need a little bit of water. I apologize. There are meetups. There are and, and workshops. You just go on Eventbrite. Go on the Facebook groups of your city. You're going to find these Airbnb meetups, dinners, everything. All right? So... That's two ways to do it for free. Number three, partner with an investor or landlord. We're investors here, so and we want to do Airbnb. Here's a trick. If you want to partner with them as a, as a co-host, you do the same thing that you're doing with the other ones, right? And then you're going to do a few more things as well. You're going to go to not the multifamily meetups. You're going to go to the residential meetups, right? You're going to... Offer to manage for a low fee. If you're getting started, why would you say, hey, I want 20%? Why? Just go for a smaller amount, get your track record, right? Make a little bit of money while at it, learn how to do it, make the mistakes, and then go do your own. Or stay with that guy and partner with him some more. All right? So you build the relationships, the same thing I said earlier. Um, real estate meetups, weekend classes, there's free real estate events all over the place nowadays, and you'll find landlords that are going to these events that are free, and you're not going to spend a dime except for your valet parking. It's 20 bucks, okay? So that's another one, and, and I was doing all these, all these. I, I wanted my Airbnbs. I was dedicated. I, I didn't stop, and I used my wholesale fees to get my first Airbnbs, and I didn't have to host, so I wanted to do my own, right? So I was able to do that, but not everybody can, so I'm giving you guys... Uh, three ways to do it without a dollar, right? Just hustle and driving around and meeting people and really being out there so that these people can can get to know you and build a relationship with you, all right? Is it good stuff so far? Yes, thank you. Uh, strategy number four, uh, this one is arbitrage, all right? You're going to rent or partner with an apartment owner, same thing as the other one, right? But now you're going to go with a different intention. You're going to build a relationship. You already have a track record. You already did it for free. You paid your dues for four, five, six months, right? So now you're going to go and do these things, right? You're going to hustle, and you're going to build a relationship and maybe send some offers, right? Because apartment owners put their properties, they put one property, if they have 20 units, and it, they have two different floor plans, they put two on the MLS. If they have 100 units, they put a couple of them to rent them. They want to get these properties out there. So if you go out there and you say, hey, I'm going to take care of your rent, and I'm going to give you $50 extra a month. He's meeting his quota, going above it. Um, I'm also going to take care of your property and have maintenance taken care of. You're the maintenance person at that time. Um, I'm also going to have prof the property professionally cleaned 
every couple of days, right? You want to be professional at this point. You're not just getting started. And if you are, awesome. You still want to be professional. You always want to look and be professional, act professional, right? So um, build a little track record. Build a little website. It's, I mean, you can get a website on Wix for like 30, 40 bucks, right? And then have an 800 number to look professional, right? I did this. That's how I did it. I, I got my first units. We sent 100 offers to apartments, uh, condos, and on the MLS, I swear. I did not want to say it. I got a, one of my realtor friends to do it. I didn't want to do it myself because I... It was a lot of work, <laughs> right? So get yourself a leasing agent that knows Airbnb, that knows most leasing agents. They are very aware what's Airbnb. They want to do it. They're doing it. And, and if you get to work with them, they can specialize in that, and it can be a unique of unique value to our community. I am working on partnering up with one um, because um, we're also working on del delivering a turnkey service. It's not out yet. But we're going to have a done-for-you service in Houston to where we do an entire thing for our customers. Okay, so to be released in a little bit. Um, uh, have your realtor send a bunch of MLS offers. Find some off MLS. Reach out to wholesalers, you know. And then sometimes these wholesalers slash investors, they also like to buy. I have wholesaler friends who own properties, a lot of them. And everybody wants to have, at the end of the day, a nice little portfolio, all right? So I hope I'm not running out of time. No? Okay, good. Um, continue to build relationships. That's key. Walk in, get referred by friends. If you know a... Hello. What? what? Hello. If you know a uh, somebody out there that has... Um, an apartment or a house or a, is, is a leasing agent, they're going to know other people. So tell your friends about it. Hey, guys, I am looking for Airbnbs. I, I want to do Airbnb. I have X amount of dollars to do Airbnbs. I want to do, I want to help manage or host. Most people start co-hosting, but that's, that's another way to get in. All right? So partner with an Airbnb host. This one is even easier because you can do the same thing you did on the other one. And uh, I'm going to walk this way because we have uh, the actual, uh, all of the verbiage on the left side. So same thing, and you add the strategies that I put on the other, uh, on the other slide. All right, you offer to split the cost. At this point, uh, you are uh, a little bit more established in, in the game. You've been maybe looking for an Airbnb for a few months, or you've co-hosted other properties as well, and then, or you've, you know, you if you're getting your first one, you've watched a lot of YouTube videos, um, you've attended some workshops or whatnot, right? So you want to utilize those that knowledge of skills, those resources to go find yourself a property, all right? Um, and you offer value. Like, that's huge. When you don't offer value and you just go ask someone for something, are they going to give it to you? No, they're not. You've got to build a relationship and offer value, okay? And I'm happy to offer value, and the more value – that I give other people, the more value I get from others. So it's it's a chain reaction. So don't don't ever think that we're in this business or right here to make money. I, I'm not here. I just flew from from Houston. I'm not here today to make money. I'm here to offer value to you guys. So do the same for others, because if you do that, it's gonna come back to you. I promise. Uh, the next strategy is, is also an arbitrage strategy. S sublease or take over someone's lease. So, so, so easy. There's so many people on Facebook that want to rent their sub sublease their properties to somebody else, right? And you can find them on Craigslist, Facebook, on rent, uh, Facebook Marketplace. Uh, I, I look at my Facebook sometimes and I say, hey, uh, they don't know how to do Airbnb. They have a full-time job. They don't want to do it. They just want to sublease it. My friends call me. They're like, hey, George. You want to lease this? It's like, no, bro. I'll I'll will manage it for you. I don't want to sublease it. You know, you're paying your rent's eighteen hundred, and your property can make twenty five. And we're not gonna make any money, right? So you gotta know your numbers. I already did my homework by that time, right? Go to real estate meetups. Uh, find some non-performing Airbnbs through Airbnb. Have a VA message other hosts with three or more properties. They're out there. So 
they need help, right? And then if it's not perform, I just picked up two Airbnbs, also in Montrose. This guy sold me both of them, one for twelve hundred bucks, the entire apartment, the bed, all of the essentials, uh, all of the electronics, everything. Yes, sir. He sold me what's inside, and I took over the lease because it's not performing. They don't know what they're doing. They're not, their these prices were way too high and for the neighborhood. We added everything that we do in our Airbnbs, right? For that quality, we, there's, in my opinion, there's three standards of staging, right? You're going to have your middle, uh, low, middle, and luxury, okay? So, and, and I'll break it down for you what, what I mean by that. Luxury properties, that's your A-class downtown, high-rise buildings, all that, right? You want to put the nicest stuff, the nicest linens, nicest sheets, everything. So he sold it to me, and it has everything. So I turn around, and I put one on Airbnb. The first month, it made 1200 bucks because I got it on the 8th, right? He sold it to me for 1200 So I pay my rent. I got probably one-sixth of, of, of the entire investment back. Then the second one, he sold me for 900 and I already rented it weekly to my old Airbnb, uh, one old Airbnb guest that needed a place weekly for $400 a week. So I just made in one month about 600 bucks minus $80 in, uh, uh, $80 in uh, utilities and minus the rent of 1000 So that's like 520 and it cost me 900 bucks in two months. Two and a half months, I can make my money back. Then I got a year lease with uh, an option to extend to as many years as I want, right? And so it's cash flow. Boom. This one, you know, it's, a, it's a, the same amount, but it didn't cost me five grand. He left me his deposit. So his Airbnb was free, if you think about it, right? So I made my money back already because when I, at the end of the year, if I say no, I'll collect $1,000, right? So next strategy, number seven. Am I on time? Because we got a lot. Oh, shoot. All right. Okay. Strategy seven, find a property for rent on the market or off market. All right. Now we're buying. So you pick one of the 858 lists, but, and you find it there. And you can buy it. Buy, buy it under market. Right? It's Zillow. There's all these properties are selling. So if you buy it under market and you get a, a loan from my lady right here for 30 years. She will give you 70% of the appraisal, right? Kelly? 70% of appraisal, right? Yes. Easy street. So y if, you g if you buy right, you won't put a lot of money down. All right? Find one on Craigslist. And if you're looking for a property, list the amenities you're looking for. I just, I just felt like throwing that up there. You know, if you, if you want something with a pool, you'll find them. Under market value. You don't need a license. You don't need to be a realtor. You don't need any of that stuff. You could do it right now. Okay. Eight. Um, purchase subject two. And I'm going to make this very simple. Read. We bought a property for $5,100 in Hockley, Texas. Took over the mortgage. It costs us 13000 to stage it. Ten for uh, essentials and everything else. And then three for labor. So that's eighteen grand. Now we have a Airbnb forever. And I didn't even put my credit down. Okay, number nine, purchase uh, under value, which uh, you can purchase it from wholesalers at a very, very, my boy right here, Simon, he's got a ton of wholesale deals, right? And you can purchase it from him. Um, find one with furniture under market. They want to get rid of it. They're, they're paying mortgage, and they don't know how to Airbnb it. And they're, you're going you're gonna to you're gonna convince them that you are going to buy this property. And then you say, I need you to include the furniture. And then the last one is a hybrid option. Okay? This is illegal in Texas, but you can lease it and then you can actually have a purchase contract at the end of your lease all at the same time under market value, furnished if you don't want it or not furnished. That easy. Set someone up to actually manage a property for you and you have an Airbnb and don't even have to do it anything and if if it doesn't work then you're going to lose what if you're leasing it you're going to lose 
Nothing. Because all the stuff you're going to pick up, right? Your option fee, if it's $5,000, that's it. But you don't lose your deposit because your lease ended. You don't lose your furniture. You don't lose your land ends. You don't lose anything. You lose your, your, your option fee. Could be 2000 5000 It doesn't matter. But you, you don't have a lot to lose is what I'm trying to tell you guys. All right? So, um, all right, let's go to the next one real quick because we are running out of time. I want to run through, look at this, and then I will not have time to show you this all together. But this is a property that I'm buying right now, and I'm supposed to close on it tomorrow, but I will be in Fort Myers, so I'm going to have someone come, a mobile notary, okay? And we have some costs, and if you want to have your three costs when you buy, right? You have three costs. Back one, there you go. I, I got maybe five minutes, right? Maybe five, less, okay. Awesome. That's what I did, hold on. That's what I did first when I'm buying it. I know my numbers. That's what I'm doing now when I'm going to refinance it and I lined everything up now, okay? And I know that it's going to cost us about 50 grand in cash, okay? I'm probably coming out of pocket 10 Gs and that's it, all right? Because I have private lenders, I've built the relationships and I did everything that I told you earlier, all right? I can't go over this because I'll get in trouble. <laughs> um, Example of exactly what I did in one of my properties. Take a picture, read it down, but that's what I made. And this is just one month's example, all right, guys? Um, that's my first year. I worked my ass off for six months, and that's where we started. That's my second year. And that's on my three accounts right now. And the total was 467000 and I reinvested a shitload of that money right back into my properties. That's how I have 34, all right? Then, that's my occupancy rate, 85% with shitty, shitty credit, shitty properties, shitty everything, right? You hustle, you hustle, hustle. I lost a club and I put 400,000 and 60,000 was on my credit and it hurt. And I'm still working on it. I had to, those two years, I couldn't pay it. And now if I go pay it, it doesn't matter. Because it's, act, it's actually charged off. It's worse if you pay it now. Okay? <laughs> so, empower 100 real estate professionals is our goal this year. All right? $1.2 million. And we're going to do it. All right? And then create the lifestyle I want. I want all you guys to do the same thing. All right? So thank you so much, and this is where you can... Uh, I'll say, tell everyone the best way to connect with you so that they can reach out about any questions they have. GeorgeSalas360.com, and this is our brand new program that we're launching. I'm partnering up with two major investors, so we're going to be launching this. So our first webinar is completely free. It's Q&A, and I'm sorry I couldn't answer your questions today, guys, but this but is But you will you be back on the panel. So stick around for towards the end. We will have, after Daniel speaks, we will have the panel. So you can ask questions then. Yes, I, I might be, I have a flight to Fort Myers. Well, then never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather go to the I'm beach. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but uh, I'm going to see in the back if I can, uh, if I can actually find a different flight for after so I can be here. Awesome. Uh, but it was, I committed and then I had already my mastermind with JT Fox that I paid $6,000 to go to. And I have to be there. Um, but then I, I have it. two commitments, and I'm sorry I can't make the panel if I can't. No, you're good. You're good. No worries. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, so guys. Appreciate it. Time. Like I said, be certain to write this down. He also has a big social media presence. He's pretty easy to find. I don't know if there's any other George Salas's, to, honestly. Um, so you can always ask your questions that you have or if you'd like to see his presentation through there. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been <laughs> I love it. So we have Milani coming up next. Uh, we're going to talk about not only starting, but ramping up your Airbnb business using other people's properties. Uh, some of that was obviously talked to up here. I'm actually very interested in this because who would like to start a business without actually having to own something? Yeah, if you don't raise your hand, come on. <laughs> that sounds amazing. So come on up.
So you guys need again, a break? while we have a quick moment while they're pulling Don't up the presentation, if you have questions that you did not get to have asked, or you have any that you think of while you're listening to these, I gave you my phone number. I'm going to give it to you again. 512-417-2348. Text me questions that you have so that I can add it to the list with the panel, okay. and I'm happy um, to get those answered for you. Again, it's 512-417-2348. Awesome. All right, guys. Okay, we're going to go through a bunch of stuff tonight. Some of it, you guys are so good. You guys are already in your seats because you just heard some of this. But we're going to give a different version of similar to what he did. He did an awesome job. Um, as we go through this, if you want a copy of the analyzer I use, if you want a copy of the webinar that's very similar to this, and also the shopping list that I use, if you be in, uh, text B&B to the 33777, then I will send that to you, okay? No matter where you are, if you're in the YouTube audience, text B&B to 33777, and then I will send that to you, okay? Now, raise your hand if you have kids in the audience. Okay, so I have five kids. These are my world right here. My oldest is 10 years old, and I love them. They are why I got into real estate investing, because I wanted to spend more time with them. Um, now, if you have kids, you know that this this is my two-year-old, which comes with a lot of fun. She is my caboose. She, is, she completes my basketball team. She is awesome. I love her so, so much. Well, I was headed to a speaking engagement, and I was going to be out of town for a week. And it was in Cancun, and I was so excited. I was taking my two oldest kids with me. And on my way to the airport, I get a text from my babysitter. And it is this picture right here of Maylee. Now, if you have kids, you know that this position is never a good thing for a two-year-old, right? Like, he's laughing. Like, he's like, yeah, I get you, right? So for two-year-olds, this is not a good thing. And so I'm like looking at this picture, like trying to, it, that the stewardess is, I'm sorry, the flight attendant is telling me to put away my phone. And I'm like, wait, but what's going on with my, my baby? Is everything okay? And I realized, oh my goodness, I forgot to tell my babysitter about my daughter's obsession with scissors. And I saw this other picture come through of the babysitter's couch that had been cut up. And I looked closer and realized, oh my goodness, she cut holes in her pretty little dress. And then you guys, you remember that cute little pigtail? Yeah, she cut it off. Look, her piggies, they're all gone. She butchered her little piggy right on off. And I was like so ticked and I, but then I also felt bad because I had forgot to tell the babysitter, hey, just a heads up, she kind of has this huge goal of cutting her hair or cutting your couch. She just loves scissors. And I have caught her climbing on different things, like climbing up really, really high. It doesn't matter where I put the scissors. She has this goal of finding the scissors, right? Um, and I felt bad because I had forgotten to kind of mention that. Well, as I was getting to this destination, no joke, that same day on Instagram, I saw this that said, she believed she could and so she did. And I thought that was just like my Maylee, especially the other half that says, and now she's in timeout. And I thought about that, and I thought, you know what, that is kind of like my real estate investing experience. Have you ever gone to a point where you, maybe you're just getting in real estate investing, or uh, you've been in real estate investing, and you're like, if I can just do this, then it's going to be perfect. If I can just do what Robert Kiyosaki taught me, then all will be well. And everything will just have whistles and it will all go so well. Well, sometimes we say we're going to go to the top of this mountain and every, the view is going to be beautiful. And I realized in my real estate investing career, that's what I thought was going to happen. Is that I had gotten into flipping houses. I had gotten into wholesaling. I had gotten into buying and selling notes. I would gotten into long-term property rental. And I thought, okay, I've climbed this mountain. It's a goal I've had for a long time. And I got there and I, you know, was doing great, selling, you know, flipping 15 houses a year. It was great. But I got to the top of that mountain, we'll say, and I realized, oh man, I think I want to be on that mountain. Have you ever had that moment where you thought this was going to be the perfect view you waited for and then it wasn't? And that's what I felt like when I was doing wholesaling and when I was doing rehabbing uh, or flipping, whatever you want to call it, when I was doing new construction, all of those things I felt like, okay, this is not why I start, well, this is not why I left my nine to five job 
so that I could be away from my family and have a ton of, of uh, uh, debt and risk and all that different things, okay? So as I started my rehabbing business, things started happening that I, were beyond my control. And that started to make me think, ah, I don't know if I want to be on this mountain anymore. I know that I want to be in real estate, so I'm in the right valley. I just don't know if I'm on the right mountain right now. And so with my, uh, this was with my house flipping business, with my rehabbing business. Um, uh, one of our properties, actually two of them, but this one in particular, we were, we were listing it three days later that weekend, and there was a drive-by shooting on our property. And I just, I, one of those things that, oh my goodness, prayers out to that family. But at the same time, I, I had these lenders on this half a million dollar property that I told them they were about to get their money back. Oh, we're listing the property this weekend. It, it's, I know the comps. It's going to sell so fast. And all of a sudden, I felt like a big fat liar. And those families, now, if some of you might use private money, some of you might use hard money. For me, I always loved my private lenders. The good thing about that is that I was helping people who I loved make a lot of money. The bad thing is, is when we got to a point due to a few different things, including a lawsuit with a contractor that made us put six of our properties on hold and I wasn't allowed to touch them for eight months of holding costs. And it came to the point that my lawyer said, maybe you start considering, do you wanna, do you wanna consider bankruptcy? And I thought about my lenders and I thought about their kids' faces and I thought about how one of my lenders, oh, I love her so much, she trusted me with her husband, her deceased husband's 9-11 memorial fund. And you guys, I had gotten to a point that I was literally having nightmares about her family and how they had trusted me with that money. And at one point during flipping, especially during this lawsuit in particular, I had leveraged $5 million worth. Some of you that might be like, oh, that's chub change, $5 million. But to me, that was a heck of a lot of money. And I was using other people's money, and I wasn't allowed to touch a lot of those projects. And it came to a point that my family, my five kids who you just met, that we were all praying and fasting that this lawsuit would end so that we could move on with our lives and move to the next chapter and not be stressing and mommy wouldn't be curled up in a ball crying. Um, and I, it makes me think of... Uh, uh, Maylee, back to Maylee. Oh, well, actually, here, this slide first. So um, I, we don't have time to get into it, but the reason why I got into real estate is actually because um, number three, child number three, um, on his second birthday was diagnosed with brain cancer. And we're so grateful he's doing awesome now, but at the time, I was at a nine-to-five job, and I barely saw my kids. And that's when I left my job and said, you know what, I'm going to do my, I'm going to follow my dreams. I'm going to stop dreaming, and I'm going to start doing and so instead of having that, why us? Why did this happen to us mentality? Instead, as a family, we decided, no, we're going to have the why not us mentality. Because whatever you believe in, I don't want to offend anybody, but whatever that is, we believe that some higher power believed that there was something bigger out there that he needed us to do, or she, whatever that is for you. But we think, why not us? Because we believe that God has a higher power for us and that he wants us to uh, turn our trials into triumphs. And so that's where when you hear me talk about the why not me mindset, it's instead of sitting back and thinking, oh, well, why do they, why can they do Airbnb? Or why do they get to go on those vacations? Or whatever it is, instead of having that why me, instead of think, why not me? What am I doing so that I'm actually chasing those dreams? Now, when I talk about that time of my life where, uh, you know, we were leveraged $5 million in it, and it came to the point that my, uh, the, they had been on hold where I couldn't touch them for seven months, six of those properties. And um, I was really, really wanting these, these houses to sell because if you have kids, you know December, it gets extra tight, right? So uh, we're figuring out how to plan Christmas. And my, my son, my oldest son, um, I was talking, he, he understands the magic of Christmas, if you know what I'm saying. And I said, well, I haven't seen your uh, letter to Santa yet. And he said, well, Mom, it's okay. I don't need one. Other, it's okay. And I said, no, really, honey. Like, what do, you want on, what do you want for Christmas? And he put down his head and he said, Mom, I only want one thing. I want you to sell a house. Oh. As a parent, my heart sank because this boy was supposed to want a new bike or something. I don't know. And, and instead, he's worried about us. 
because with flipping houses and, and, and the choices I had make, made in real estate investing, even though we had parts that we had done really well, we always so had parts that had made it so that we were super risky. And uh, that's one of the reasons. When I talk about this, I talk about my ambition hangover because I was literally throwing up in the toilet because I, 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 and I don't even drink, so I don't know really what a hangover feels like, but I kind of picture it being like this. And so I picture it being, I call it my ambition hangover because I, I was so nauseous having nightmares about these families, about the risk that I, I was at. And that's when I realized, I know I'm in the right valley. I know I want to be in real estate. I know I want to be in real estate investing, but I am on the wrong mountain. And that's when I, I thought about Maylee and I thought about, you know, so as we're talking about this, you know, her choice. She had a mountain that she wanted to climb. It wasn't the best mountain to be on, okay? Now, this is why I Airbnb. It's because I realized I had gotten into real estate investing so I could be with my kids. Then I started flipping houses and I was on projects all the time. I was on projects on Saturday mornings instead of at soccer games. I was, uh, you know, having this leverage. You know, we could go on. If you flip houses, I think you know what I'm talking about. But I decided that I saw how well my Airbnbs were doing, and I'm like, I want to do more than that. I want to do a heck of a lot more than that because I realized that in that balance of which one was going to win of my career or my family, I was so worried that the wrong one was going to slide off. Okay, so when I sat down with my husband and we talked about what does our dream day really look like? What do we really want to do with our life? And why are we even doing this real estate investing thing, right? So um, our goal was to build a life that we didn't need a vacation from. And we thought we were doing that with flipping houses. We thought we were doing that with wholesaling. We thought we were doing that with long-term traditional rentals. But when we actually got to the top of that mountain, we realized, ah, there's got to be a better way. Okay, and that's uh, the reason why I give that whole background is to tell you that, guys, there's you're in the right place. Real estate investing, we know, is a great place to make money. But make sure that you're at the top of the mountain that you actually want to be at and you're in this section that you really want to be there. Okay, so whatever your why is, why you're here, what is your, you know, uh, your why, why your interest in Airbnb, whatever that is. I want you to keep that in your mind and think about what you're doing to accomplish your dream day with why you're here, okay? Now, let's see if this is going to work for us. I don't know if the sound's hooked up or not. Thanks. short-term rental game. Don't let those concerns stand in your way. Opening a B&B takes hard work, but isn't hard. In fact, it might be the easiest job to get. You don't even have to put on your fancy interview power suit to land the job. If you're willing to provide a nice clean home, be hospitable, and aim for excellence, then you've got the job. If you put proper systems in place and work smarter, not harder, you are going to love this investment. And here's a little secret. You don't even have to own the property to get the profits. That's right. You can get into B&B investing using other people's properties. That means no big down payments. If big things break, like air conditioning, it isn't your money. But once you love the property, then offer to buy it. Don't get stuck behind your excuses. Let us take you step by step through the process of B&B investing and show you how to master working smarter, not harder to achieve your financial goals. Visit whynotmebnb.com to learn more today. So one of the fun things about um, being a working mom, I love to involve my kids in, in our family business, we'll call it, okay, as being an entrepreneur. And so this is AJ. This is our miracle son that survived his uh, brain cancer cancer, and he's doing awesome, and he wants to be a stand-up comedian someday, and I hope to get to see him on stage someday. But when um, we were making that commercial, he's like, uh, my, my assistant had sent me uh, three different narrators to choose, and I pulled up the page, and it also had like a Mickey Mouse narrator, and he's like, Mom, N Mickey Mouse should totally be the narrator of this. <coughs> we opted not for Mickey Mouse, but yeah. 
Um, okay, so today we're not going to have time to get into all the details of Airbnb hosting. You can tell you've been sitting here for hours, some of you, and there's just so much to go through. There's so much to cover. In fact, uh, it, in, in the course, it, so I, we do coaching, we do, um, we have an online course. There's so many different parts to it, but the part we're going to focus on, um, is really how three different ways to successfully make you into um, a superhero, into an Airbnb superhero. So maybe you're a super host, maybe you're not. Um, there, I'll get, I'll have a confession. Sometimes I'm not a super host. It doesn't matter. Um, we can talk about that a different time. But um, making sure we're going to talk about the three different types of hosting and how to get your Airbnb up and running um, within 45 days. Okay, now when I say Airbnb, I'm talking about any type of short-term rental, okay? I'm talking about VRBO, I'm talking about Homeway, I'm talking about Booksings.com, whatever it is, okay? Airbnb is the new chapstick. It's the new tissue, okay? That, that's just what we call it, all right? The new Kleenex, okay? Um, so now the next question is, is, well, how do I know which platform to use? Well, that depends. That depends on your location. It depends on how far in advance you want to keep your calendar open. It depends on the size of the property. It depends on the type of group. Let me give you some examples. Okay. So I know that with Airbnb, most Airbnb users book between 14 and 45 days in advance. So if I am using someone else's property and I'm not convinced that I want to stick with their property for a super long time, which is what usually I do, I only like to keep my prop, my calendar open for three months in advance. Okay. So that steers me towards more of an Airbnb type platform. VRBO is going to be a longer six to eight month booking average. Okay. Well, it's actually like a four and a half to eight month booking, okay? So depending on how far in advance, if you only like to have your calendar open for three months, then you're probably gonna be looking more at like an Airbnb or a bookings.com, okay? The size of the property, um, a lot of the larger properties are on more of a VRBO home away, okay? Smaller properties are first Airbnb, second VRBO, okay? So a lot of these, you're gonna, we're gonna talk about how to set up so that you can be on multiple platforms, um, but just to know which one you wanna be your primary one. But for me, mo my goal is that once they come to my property once, now it depends on where you are, but I want them to come back to go to my website, okay? I don't wanna be up against Airbnb and bookings.com forever. Once they come to my property and they know I'm a good host, they know my level of hospitality, then I follow up with them and say, next time you come to the area, look at one of our other properties as well. They know my brand. They know that I will take care of them. They know that I like really soft pillows. They know that I use really good toilet paper. Whatever it is, they know my brand. Okay, so as we go through this, here are a number of different types of Airbnbs. These are real Airbnbs that you can find. Um, a clock tower suite, a tree house. I know I'm buzzing through these. Um, dog bark park inn. Now these are real RVs that go in Los Angeles for $236 a night. Now that is a really cool view and a really cool RV, but it's still an RV going for $236 a night. And these hammocks, y'all, they don't even have bathrooms and they're going for $25 a night. Okay, so I really want you to think about how creative you can get with your Airbnb, all right? Now, we're going to talk about a traditional rental, which is like a regular annual lease versus um, an Airbnb, okay? Now, how much, somebody tell me, if you have traditional rentals, how much do you hope to make as a landlord? Someone throw out a number. 300, 500 a month. Would we agree that's kind of the range? That seems to be about the national average, okay? So you're, you're hoping, we're taught that you, you get a job, you invest it in real estate, you get a, you get a property and you get a, a, a tenant and then you net 300 to $500 a month. If you do better than that, awesome, congratulations. And you're building that equity, right? Well, um, but then all of a sudden you might have an eviction thrown in there, you might have um, damage to your property, you might have a broken HVAC, whatever it is, okay? So those go into the calculations, but it's okay because you're still building equity, okay? That's what we hear. Now, with, uh, uh, with, with the Airbnb, I, sorry, I thought I had a slide for this, so that's what I'm kind of looking at real quick. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, here we go. Sorry about that. 
Okay, we're looking at 300 to 500 months. We're looking at weeks, maybe even months of vacancy. We're looking at those surprises of leaky roofs, HVAC, whatever that is, right? Well, with Airbnb, this is like an average, okay? Some Airbnbs are doing way better than this. One of our properties is netting 6,000 a month, okay? So, it, but I would say a good average, okay, would be about 500 to $1,500 a month. This is net. This is after I've paid my mortgage or my rent, my utilities, my Netflix, my pest control, all of that, okay? So we're looking at 300 to 500 compared to 500 to 1500. Instead of weeks of vacancy, we're looking at days vacancy, okay? And instead of having all those surprises, the things we're gonna talk about today allow you to test the property so you know um, you have a better idea before you buy a property if there are weird leaks in the roof, if there is a problem with the HVAC, if at 11 o'clock every night there's a weird sound in the wall, whatever it is, okay? So you get a chance to test the property. Now, let's dive in and talk about those three types of hosting, okay? The first one is going to be ownership, then arbitrage, then co-hosting. I know the last speaker before me taught, like, told 10 different ways. I was in that room, and it's like so noisy, so I didn't hear it at all, but I could see his slides. So some of this might be a little bit of a review, um, but in a, in a different, hopefully, uh, format. So, that, so don't leave. It's still going to be good, <laughs> okay? Now, when to do ownership. There are certain times that I do think that ownership is good. One, you already have the property, okay? Maybe it's in your basement. Maybe it's in your backyard and you have a guest house. Maybe um, you already have a traditional property of rental and you want to try it as an Airbnb, but you already own it. Maybe you have a favorite destination that you want an excuse to say, it's okay, it's an investment property at the beach, at uh, you know, a cabin in the woods, whatever it is, okay? Um, and Or if you've already tested the neighborhood as an Airbnb. One of my biggest mistakes in my early days was the first property that I did the arbitrage model, which we're going to talk about in a second, I did the arbitrage model, I tested it, and within four months, I knew it was going to be amazing. And so I offered to buy the property. We bought the property two months later. We still had like six more months on the lease, and we bought the property. Oh, I kick myself still. Why did I not send a direct mail piece to every single person in that neighborhood? Once I tested that property, I should have pot up every single one because you guys, six months later, five of those sold. And I'm so ticked at myself still. I, I don't know if you can tell I'm still a little bitter. Um, that I'm so mad at myself that I didn't offer to buy all of those in the neighborhood because I could tell what a great performer it is. That's one of the ones that we're making $2,000 a month on. And that's net after we've paid everything. And I'm so mad at myself. Anyways, I'll move on. But once you've tested it, once you know it's a good area, it's a good neighborhood, that you know the going rate, you know the occupancy rate, you know the neighbors, you know that what kind of area it is, then you offer to buy the property. Or if you know the area, then you can buy others in the neighborhood as well. Okay? Now let's dive into using other people's properties. Okay? Now... <coughs> The two versions are called arbitrage and co-hosting. Now, why would you even want to use other people's properties? We talked about it a little bit, but um, when I first got into this, um, we turned our traditional properties over to uh, short-term rentals and found that we were making about three times more than we were as a traditional rental. And I was like, I want to do this. I want to do it a lot more, but I don't have that big down payment every month or however often you want to open a new one. But we knew the margins were so high that there was enough room for me and a landlord to still make money and still be happy. And so when you're using other people's property, you don't have to worry about that big down payment. Okay? Now, also, this gives us a chance to test the property before we buy it. I like to call it that I'm dating it. I'm finding out its quirks. I'm finding out if there's a really grouchy neighbor next door that's going to call the city every day and say that we're doing something illegal, even if we're not. I get to see if, you know, whatever weird things, just like when we were dating as people, you're, you're looking to find the quirks to see if this is going to be a good fit. When I talked earlier about how I only like to keep my calendar open three months in advance, it's because I'm dating this landlord. I want to see if this is going to work and if I'm dating the property to see if this is a long-term thing. So that's why I don't open my calendar way far in advance, okay? I only do the 90 days. And on Airbnb, that's totally fine. Um, 
It tests, like we talked about, it tests the location, um, prove their rates. So you're, you know, like I talked about in the middle, I, I kind of have an issue with risk ever since my uh, curl in a ball ambition hangover. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I, um, my, I, I'm testing everything before I put down a big down payment and take out that loan for to actually purchase the property. Okay. Also, of course, those major fixes, this gives me a chance. If I have a property that I can tell is doing well, that I'm going to want to buy, um, when we get a little bit closer to the end, I'm starting to look at, uh, I don't know if the air conditioning has been working very well. I don't know if this, I don't know if this. Well, during that time, that's my chance to ask the landlord, you know what? I don't think we've had an air conditioning tune-up lately for the last couple years. Any chance you want to go in and send someone to check that? And so then I get an inspection report of the air conditioning or, you know, whatever it is. So that gives you an opportunity to really test out all those big items before you purchase it, okay? Uh, let's see. Okay, so with either of these options, you start with the house and you've got a landlord and you guys, they actually put a sign out. This is different than wholesaling. It's different than rehabbing. You're not just going door knocking. You're not doing direct mail. They actually say, please come rent my house. Now I know sometimes when you flip houses, you do find a great deal for somebody that had listed their house for sale. But some of my best deals I had to go out looking for. And so with this, they are saying, this house is for rent, please come rent it. And you or me comes along, usually I often have one or two kids with me, um, and I come along and I say, I want to rent your house. It's perfect, it's exactly what I've been looking for. Now, you'll notice I didn't say anything about Airbnb. I didn't say anything about short-term rental. I'm going to talk about that later, but right now I'm not quite ready to, to tell that, okay? In just a second, we'll talk about how I, my, my motto is be transparent, but not upfront, okay? So, um, so when, with, let's talk about with, oh, with both of these options, we're going to talk about how clean we're going to leave it. Oh my goodness, Mr. Sir, whatever. Uh, you, I love this property. It's perfect. It's exactly what I've been looking for. And I promise I'm going to have it. I am a clean freak and I'm going to have it professionally cleaned multiple times a week or month. And I am actually going to leave it in five star status because I get reviewed multiple times a week or month to make sure that I'm leaving it at a five star status. So I'm going to keep it in impeccable condition. And you know what? I'm going to use your contract, whatever it is, that you want, I just want to add an addendum to it to make sure that we both know that we're on the same page, okay? So these are the three things. There's there's other things that we go through also um, in a letter that I, some, I send to my landlords, but these are the big things that you really want to cover and you really want to nail into them. The other thing that's not on here is that this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. If you guys are landlords, you know that if you have uh, two tenants that are looking and one says, I'm here for 12 months and then I know I'm being my job is going to move me or I'm here for graduate school and then I'm leaving versus a family that's like, we really love the neighborhood. We'd like to raise our children here. You're probably going to want to go with the one that plans to be there a while, right? So you're going to say, I am going to be, when you come to this point, you're going to talk about how you're moving in furniture, you're taking pictures, you're listing it on an Airbnb or whatever. And then you're going to talk about how you want to be here for the next five 10 years with this landlord. And as soon as they're ready to sell, you hope they'll sell it to you. Okay. Now he, the last speaker talked about how there's creative ways to do that financing. If you'd like to actually do the lease to option. Um, but for now we'll t just talk about how you want to make sure that he knows he or she knows that you are in a relationship that you hope lasts a long time. Okay. Now, actually getting into arbitrage. Arbitrage, you might have heard that word and some of you might be familiar with it. This is the fancy definition. Basically, it's a fancy way of saying subletting, okay? This is subletting, all right? Um, now, with arbitrage, you're gonna go in, you're gonna um, sign a six to 12 month lease, okay? Now, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but the best time to do arbitrage is right now, is in January, because you get a lot of uh, landlords that are desperate that are a lot that are looking for anybody to rent their property, even if it's just for five months, okay, to get it back on that summer selling cycle, okay. So, um, but if you're looking in May, June, July, August, you're definitely going to be looking at more of a ten to twelve month lease to test it out. But make sure they know that you're hoping it's a long term relationship, okay? With arbitrage, usually you're going to be paying for the utilities and you're going to be paying for the furnishings as well. Um, also, this one. 
Let's see if, no, it didn't come up. This one um, uh, with arbitrage, you're gonna, it's a regular lease. So you're going to have a set monthly amount that you're paying. You can set up a bill pay and you sign a regular contract, exactly what the landlord wants. Some of my landlords I haven't spoken to in years except for I send them chocolates on Christmas. Okay, so they know they it, they know exactly what they're getting every single month. Now with co-hosting, it's going to be a little bit different. The way that every you can be really creative with this, as with everything with Airbnb. Okay, with Airbnb you saw some of those creative properties, but with co-hosting you can be very 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 creative. Okay, what I do is I do at least a six month commitment. Okay, I also charge a setup fee. Okay, you can choose what that is. For me, it's usually a thousand dollars. That just shows we're serious about this, but we want to get you in. Um, but they're not going to turn around and that fast get rid of you as well. Okay, um, utilities usually they pay for the utilities. Furnishings usually they pay for the utilities. Furnishings, and then the money the the money you that you earn is based on a percentage. Okay, depending on the services you offer. I've seen anywhere from 10 to 50%. Um, so that varies widely depending on what you offer. I usually, I usually do it for 20 to 30%, okay? Um, so here breaks down. Now I see a lot of people taking pictures. By the way, if you wanna send me a text message, the BNB to 33777, keep taking pictures. You're fine to take pictures. But if you want to, I'm happy to send you this presentation as well, okay? If you missed anything. Okay, um, so arbitrage, you're gonna be looking at paying the first and last month's rent, your security deposit, your furnishings, utilities. Now this part, you get to keep the furnishings. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. It's a lot easier bookkeeping because you just have the set monthly rate. HOA and city issues. Everybody always asks, well, they don't allow it in Grapevine. They don't allow it in whatever. Guys, there's a lot of properties right around that city. And so there's, I do, t I do, do, do strongly encourage you to know what's going on in your city and your county and if you need a permit, but don't let that scare you off. There is a ton of money to be made in this industry and don't let that scare you off. Just become educated on what that is and how other people are handling it, okay? But as an arbitrage, I just want to make sure that you know that with arbitrage, it makes it a little bit harder because if, um, since you're not the landlord, it's harder to get grandfathered in, okay? So just something to be aware of when you do arbitrage. This allows you more control, which we're going to be talking about when we come over here. Okay, so over here on co-hosting, you can do it literally with zero startup costs, okay? because the rent, furnishing, utilities, everything is gonna be on the owner. I do pay my move-in team, um, and I do pay for professional photos, so let's say that that's about $500. You can choose if you wanna do those or not, though, okay? Now, with the furnishings, this is really, really important, okay? If you don't have the funds and you want them to pay for the furnishings, great. Two things about furnishings real quick. One, if you're having them pay for it, make sure that you have input on what they buy. Okay, one of the properties I did, it was my very first co-hosting, and I was like, yes, um, I, I came into, there. she's like, I have a few pieces that I want to keep, and I was like, okay, so we look at the pieces, and I was like, okay, yeah, we'll make those work, this was back in the day, guys, and um, I was like, now the carpet, I, I feel like we're going to need to do something about the carpet, and usually I don't, I don't rehab my properties to highest, but this carpet was pretty bad, guys. And so she said, okay, don't worry. I, I have been thinking about putting in luxury vinyl anyway. So I was like, okay. So she put in some LVT and she said, come back and see it on Saturday. So guys, I came back to see it. And she said, and it's going to be the kind that looks like wood planks. And I'm like, oh, oh perfect. That's going to be great. Um, and I come back and y'all, this was a three bedroom ranch. And she had chosen five different colors of luxury vinyl and old tile throughout the house. I didn't even know there were that many kinds, but they had like, it was like gray, white, brown, and it was terrible. It was terrible. So meanwhile, I was like, it's great. And I'm like looking like, what is the biggest rug I can fit in this room, right? So when you have them buy the furnishings, what I do is I either give them a menu. Here are the three queen beds you can use. Here are the, they like that also because you're doing a lot of the work for them, but also it gives you a little more of the control. Or do you guys have Ashley Furnitures here? Okay, so you can find your own 
furniture store if you want, but L Ashley Furniture will give you a corporate discount, which is really good, and it comes with a designer. So you just hook up your landlord with the designer, and then it's somebody who has been trained in interior design to help guide them through the process. So no matter where I set up my properties, no matter what state I set up properties in, I go, and if there's an Ashley Furniture, I look and I interview which designer I trust the most, and then that is my designer in that location, okay? And then they guide them through the process, okay? Now, the second thing about furnishings is if you have enough money to pay for it, I highly recommend that you pay for the furnishings. The reason why is, remember how we talked about this is like dating a landlord? Well, this is like moving in to the boyfriend's house, all right? Because once you've moved your furniture into the landlord's house, it's a lot harder for them to get rid of you. But whenever you're ready to leave, you take your furniture. Does that make sense? So uh, that's just something to remember that if you do have enough money to pay for the furnishings, I do recommend you doing that. If it doesn't work out with this landlord, you just take those furniture, those furnishings to your next place. Does that make sense? All right. I keep on hearing noises in the background, and then I'm like, oh, that's the party outside. I think people are talking to me. So if anybody back there does want to say anything, then let me know. Um, so this one is a little bit harder. We talked about the 90-day cancellation notice. That's why I keep my calendar open for 90 days in advance. Um, and then this one with co-hosting. Another thing you need to be aware of is that with arbitrage, like I said, I don't talk to my arbitrage landlords except for at Christmas when I send them a Christmas card. Um, but with... Uh, co-host, these, they're like, you are their way into the business. And they've always wanted to be a real estate investor. And they maybe, th maybe they are, but they've always wanted to be in the Airbnb. And they will call you and they will call you a lot. And every last day of the month, they'll say, how did we do? How did we do this month? Or I have one that um, will call me or email me like once a week with a new idea of how we're going to make this Airbnb better. So just so you know, with co-hosting, they feel like they're a partner in your business. So you've got to decide if that's something that you want to do or not. And to be honest, one of my co-hosting clients, a.k.a. my dad, this one, uh, he calls me a lot, a lot. And I'm like, at Sunday dinner, in fact, my other sister who doesn't do real estate investing at all, she's like, is there any way we could have a Sunday dinner and not talk about Airbnb's dad? So I, he, at one point, he was asking so many questions um, that at, at, and about a property. My, my dad, like, invests himself in this. And, like, he loves seeing the messages pop up. And, like, a, <laughs> at one point, there were, like, two people. They're like, I'd like to book for this day. And somebody else said, I want to book about this day. And he, like, calls me and says, what are we going to do about this? Mind you, I don't think we have a ton of time to talk about this, but when I set up a property, my goal is to only go back to the property once a year and to set up systems using, uh, to set up systems so that I don't even get the messages. I'm not handling that. I, I, I've got a bunch of properties out there. I'm sure there are messages going back right now, but I don't have to handle those, okay? That is not the goal of turning this into a passive lifestyle, okay? But my dad loves it. And so my dad will be like, what do you think about this? And he'll call me and be like, what do you think about this? And I'm like, I don't know. What's going on? Like, look at dad's properties. What's going on? And he'll be like, uh, they're both, they both want the property. And I'm like, well, probably whoever gives us their credit card first is going to get it. But then somebody did, and then he was worried about the other guest. And I said, Dad, maybe it's time that I turn, because I manage these properties for you, you don't even have to look at these. Like, let's turn down your notifications so you don't have to worry about this. And he said, well, you choose. Either I'm going to keep on getting excited about my notifications, or I'm moving into your house so I can watch your kids all day, and I watch what you guys do all so you can entertain me. And I said, Enjoy your notifications, Dad. That's great. That's great. Okay, so some people love that part of it. Some people love to hear what's going on with their guests. They want to know. My, my dad, oh, he's so sweet. I just love him. And he's in his, like, mid-70s, and uh, he just loves to see him come through. Oh, we had a problem with the Wi-Fi. And I'm like, they just didn't know the Wi-Fi password, even though we've told them five times, Dad. So if you love that part, what I'm saying is make it what you want out of it. That's what I love about this Airbnb hosting thing is you get control if you love every detail of it. But guys, if you don't and you want to have a life, there are ways to turn this passive so that you don't have to worry about that.
Okay, sorry. That has nothing to do with this slide, and I just went on a tangent, and I apologize. Okay, so people are going to ask, which one is better? Should I do arbitrage or should I do coasting? And the answer is it totally depends. It depends on your location, and it depends on your phase of life. It depends on if you have the money to pay for furnishings or whatever. But again, guys, Airbnb, you can be as creative as you want. In fact, one of my students, they just got a house in Orlando, Florida, and they paid $500,000 for it, and then they put $250,000 into the rehab of it, and they turned it into a Star Wars galaxy. And it's a seven-bedroom house, and each room is a different galaxy. Now, you get to be, like I said, as creative as you want with this, and so what they've done is they are now, uh, they offer experiences. On Airbnb, you can do a stays, experienced adventures. There's lots of different things you can do. One of the experiences is that they provide is Darth Vader can pick you up from the airport in a limo. And so you get to choose. You can be however creative you want with this, right? And I love that part of it. Okay. So the answer is whatever, whichever one works for you, for arbitrage, co-host, or ownership, okay? Now, real quick, um, we touched on it a little bit, but let's talk about the difference between rehab, wholesaling, that type of real estate investing versus Airbnb, okay? Now, when we talk about uh, rehabbing and wholesaling, we're talking about some cold calling, right? We're talking about one big payout, that great day that you get that final check after a big rehab and you're so excited. And then the next day you wake up and you're like, okay, I'm free except for what's bringing in money, right? Because you did this big project, but there's no recurring revenue, right? And so with that, you have big paychecks and one big payout, and there's a lot of risk using other people's, pro uh, other people's, sorry, other people's money or hard money lending. You've got that interest that's constantly on there, so there's just a lot of risk. Over here in Airbnb, they advertise, please come rent my house, okay? It's a recurring stream of income. Don't get me wrong, when I set up an Airbnb, my goal is to break even on month six through 10. So I won't see a dime because I know that I paid for my furnishings, I paid for my you know, upfront costs. So I know I'm not gonna see my income for six months, sometimes eight months, sometimes 10 months. However, after that, I get a monthly income. I don't have to go back out and find another property. I know what will be coming in. Okay, so it does take a little ment a mental shift, but I love that recurring steady paycheck that comes in. Okay, and then it's a lower risk because you, if you don't like it, if you decide, never mind, I hate this, this is terrible, she lied to me, then it's okay. After your contract is up, you can leave. You, you, could, you, could break your, you can be done with your contract and say, I'm done with Airbnb, sell, sell your furniture, okay? But guys, if you set up the systems, I'm telling you, it's not gonna happen, okay? Now, um, which, uh, this is the thing that we talked about um, oh good, we still have time for a few more minutes. If you want the slides, if you want the analyzer, if you want the shopping list, then text BNB to 3377 or in there. I also have things that you can fill out if you're not into the texting. Okay, the things that I'm gonna send you, this is an analyzer that I'm gonna send you that you're gonna, it, it goes through how to look at your comps for three different properties so that you can analyze which property is best. When I look for properties, especially when I'm using other people's properties, I make a list of 20 properties. When I say I do, you can start by doing it, but then eventually it's really easy to teach a virtual assistant how to do this. And so they make a list of 20 properties to look through. And then um, from that 20, I'm hoping to get three to five yeses. Okay. So I put my three favorite on here because I know that with my capabilities um, and your capabilities that I can realistically move into three properties in one day. Okay, so that's why I'm looking for my three favorites. And then from these three, I do a breakdown in this analyzer that I will send you that will tell me which of these three is actually worth my time to, to um, stick with it and actually um, open it, okay? The thing I talked about is to be transparent but not upfront. So when I... Um, when I'm contacting landlords, I don't mention the short-term rental until we've actually connected, until I've actually got them on the phone, or until um, they reach out to me via email, okay? So, um, meaning if I've emailed them and they said, tell me more, or yes, 
yes, it's available, this. Then I'd start, then I let them know about the short-term rental thing, okay? Otherwise, you're not going to get any responses, okay? Remind them that, that you are open to using their contract, but you have to use your addendum. You have to use some sort of addendum. Um, if we have an addendum that we love, but talk to a real, uh, an attorney to get an addendum that protects you, okay? Now, you're going to make sure that you want to memorize those selling points that we talked about, the professional cleaning. The minute we talk about how, oh, we, you know, our guests, we rarely use the, the refrigerator. We, I mean, when you go to a place, so many people are like, oh, yes, we love the kitchen, and then they never use it, right? Um, it's the same thing when I offer bikes. On a lot of my properties, I'll put up a picture of our bike, and people always pay, you, they pay extra to use the bikes. But so many times, they'll pay for the bikes, and the bikes are exactly where we left them. However, it was an upcharge, so we still got the funds, but so many people are like, oh, let's rent that place. It's got bikes. That's fun. So just be creative of what you're going to do to help get people in, right? Um, you talk about how you maintain the five-star status. And then also, to this point, I have not gone to see any properties, okay? Just to be clear, I'm not driving. When I make the list of 20, I haven't seen any of these properties in per it, it, at all yet, okay? I've looked at the pictures and I know the location and I know that the numbers pretty much make sense. But as soon as they show interest, I say, okay, I'm ready. And my goal is to get it under contract that night as soon as they say yes, okay? But I haven't gone to see it until they've said, yes, it's worth it, okay? Otherwise, you're going to burn out and it's not going to be worth it, okay? Now, quick, we're almost done. So if anybody is, well, we're almost done, I promise. Um, we talked about the tips. Um, the peak finding seasons for using other people's properties is October to February, and the hardest season is going to be June to August. So I know that I don't open properties in July and August just because there's so many traditional traditional rentals out there that it's not worth me trying to train a landlord at this point, okay? But if in January, it's a great time. February, great time. March, still good, okay? But just the peak season is October to February. Um, the average, that just means when I do a list of 20, um, don't be discouraged with a lot of no's, okay? So get used to hearing no, but be ready to act on a yes. Also make sure when you're reaching out to these 20 landlords, remember that Calling or emailing them once is not trying, okay? That is like emailing. <laughs> but to actually try to contact these landlords, you're going to touch them three to seven times. That's emails, that's texts, that's uh, phone calls, okay? And I try to touch them three to seven times within a three-day period, okay? I am hounding these people for three days because I have a set timeline that I'm on. Now, the last thing is, is just remember that you have something that they want. In fact, they, you have a better offer than they even know that's out there. They just know that they want somebody to pay them rent. They just know that they want um, to have that steady income. They don't realize that there really is somebody out there that's going to keep it at a five-star level, that's going to have it professionally cleaned. How many renters out there do you know that pays a professional cleaning service twice a week to come into their house? This is a great offer, right? This is an amazing offer. So don't go in and be like, well, do you want to do this? Go in confident. This is better than they even knew was possible, okay? Um, be persistent. Don't get discouraged. Um, the risk is so much less um, than those other things that we've talked about. Love it if that's what you're doing. Congratulations. That's great. Um, I love this. I love this quote, and we'll end on this. It says, it's by Tony Robbins, and it says, people usually overestimate what they can do in a year, but they underestimate what they can do in a decade. Y'all, I started doing Airbnbs about three years ago, and it, like I talked about, it, it is so different knowing that I set something up, it's going to take a few months for me to start to see that money, but then it's a, it's a steady recurring stream of income that I can't tell you, it, it, is, it changes your life as a real estate investor. So if you have any, this is a, one more time if you want to, um, you can reach out to me. We've got a podcast that's launching this month called Why Not Me Academy. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Maylani Hawk Coaching. I don't even have my email on here, guys. Sorry. It's Maylani at whynotmeairbnb.com. Maylani at whynotmeairbnb.com. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. That was great. I, I think everyone can. Here we go. Sorry. Took a minute. That was great. I appreciate the information. Does anybody have any questions?
great question. So she's asking if you need to have an LLC to get started with Airbnbs. Um, so my my attorney will say seek legal counsel. The real what I say is if you're having one, you're okay to just start it. Um, and then see how it goes. But definitely once you, it's, it also depends on if you own the property or not. But I, I say the sooner the better that you can get an LLC because I love to write off my travel. In this industry, not just in real estate investing, but when I'm doing hospitality research in Europe, uh, I get to write, my accountant lets me ride that off a lot easier when I was flipping houses, okay? So I definitely recommend starting that entity as soon as you can so you can start writing off some of those things. And if you have more questions, many of you have been texting me, by the way, thank you. I have a lot of questions oh, for our panel. She will be on our, Melanie will be on our panel. So I want y'all to do me a favor. We're about to have Daniel come out to talk about big updates because many of you saw last night this is going to be the last event. Help me. Everybody get real loud and say, get in here. So everybody out there gets in here. One, two, three. Get in here. attendees <laughs> get in here <laughs> Fantastic. Good. So, I you so without further ado let me grab the man who has given us oops sorry so one of the things that I thought was interesting about today is, you know, we're always talking about how do you get into real estate investing with little or no money. It sounds like, you know, wholesaling, you actually need to put energy. Yeah, you can drive for dollars, but that takes money. Airbnb genuinely seems like it's something you could get into with very little money, if you, especially if you're going to use arbitrage or co-hosting. What do you all think about that? Do you think that would be a, a good first way for someone to get into real estate investing and get their feet wet? I agree. So it makes you wonder why people, more people aren't doing it or why it's not more popular. Because whenever I'm going on vacation, especially when our family is having a big group family vacation, I have four siblings, well, three siblings, I'm sorry, there's four of us. And there are how many grandbabies, dad, seven? Y'all, my dad is here in the audience. He was so excited to come up. Um, so there's seven kids and then all these adults. So we always get a big house somewhere. And I have to say, the first thing we look at is what they were saying. If we're going somewhere hot, we want a pool. We want enough beds. We want to be able to have some common area where we can all sit together and enjoy each other. We also like to have our meals together. So I've never thought about going for a larger house because to me, that's like going after a luxury flip. It's a real expensive if it doesn't work out. But it sounds like that's what most people look for. So I'm curious to hear more about that on the panel, and that's what a lot of people were texting me. So thank you again. If you weren't in here earlier, if you have questions for our panel, I'm going to give you my cell phone number, 512-417-2348. Please text me your questions. I have many. I'll try to get to all of them. If we do not, I apologize, but I think that everyone here has been easily taggable, whether it's you find them on social media or through their emails or however. So I'm happy to either connect you with whomever I know or I'm sure we're all happy to help you. So I'm going to ask y'all's favor one more time. Let's yell so the people that are out there in the hallway finally walk in so we can get started. One, two, three, get in here. Get in here, y'all. Nicholas. Hey, Propelio attendees. We're asking for everyone to please come into the auditorium now. We would love for you to come and join us as Daniel is about to share with us what's new and coming. Please come in soon. Seats are filling up. I should have added there's an upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big one.
You ready? You ready? Here we go, guys. I give you the man, the myth, the legend that brought us so much, giving away free education. It is my honor, and I'm humbled. Good morning. I'll run the lap. Mic check. There we go. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. Thank y'all for all the love. I appreciate all the support that y'all have given us over the years. I know that last night I made a pretty big announcement. Got a feedback in my mic. Did a pretty big announcement last night. I had a lot of y'all reaching out to me through private messages and things of that nature asking, you know, hey, what's going on? Why is Propelio shutting down? Is Propelio shutting down? Are the events shutting down? What's going on? So I'm here to clarify a little bit of that for you. I'm going to take a few minutes before we get to the panel, kind of let y'all know what's going on within the company. And many of y'all are new to the Propelio community. Y'all really don't know much about my past. I've been somewhat quiet for the past year. I've gone through a lot of my own personal development through the last year. And I want to kind of open up and show y'all a little bit about what's going on. And to do that, I really kind of need to show y'all the beginning and break some of that down for you. I wanted to show with y'all kind of what I call a success line. Looking at a success line, we all hear, you know, America is the land of opportunity. We all have equal opportunity. I call bullshit on that. We do not have equal opportunity. And for those of you that would like to argue that with me, give me 15 minutes to drop some of this on you. Going through this, most people start their life out born into just over broke. You are born into a family of just over broke. You are one paycheck away from broke. That is the majority of America. We are an employment country, and most employees are one paycheck away from broke. All of that to be said, we grow up in a broke household, and we move into the indoctrination of school. We go through school, and school teaches us to be obedient employees. Now, this is my personal opinion. No one has to agree with that. But most people that go through school end up in the exact same position. After you make it out of school, where do you end up? Just over broke. And that is the cycle that most Americans are in. Would everybody at least agree that most Americans are one paycheck away from being broke? Yes. Is that a problem? Yes. It is a huge problem. For a very select, small few of the people that make it out of school, whether that is through high school, through college, indifferent, it's all an indoctrination in my opinion. A very select few of those people that make it out into that J-O-B on this success line will achieve this little portion right here. And that little portion right there I'm going to call the $100,000 millionaire. They've got a nice house. They've got a nice car. They've got a nice wardrobe. But how many paychecks are they away from being broke again? One. Now, that exact same person, if they lived a different lifestyle, could take some of that extra income, reapply it back into growing themselves, and likely break through that next ceiling, but they don't do it because they are starved for the Facebook fame of houses, cars, and clothes. I'll move forward further down the success line. In every one of these marks on this success line is another ceiling that a person will have to break through to achieve the next level. A select few of these people will go into solopreneurship, essentially being a one-man operation. One, two, three people. And what I would like to stress is that many of the people that do go into solopreneurships still land themselves into just over broke. Most solopreneurs that you will meet will be working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. to make it to just over broke. Is that a problem? Why are so many of these people, you hear the nine out of ten businesses fail, why is that? And I still keep asking that question, why is that? It is only this very small, select few people that go into entrepreneurship and actually succeed and achieve the wealth that we're all looking for. Why is that? I truly believe that there are key things that create the differences between the people that make it into here and the people that live in over here. 
If I continue further down this, and you'll start seeing this resemble Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant. But as I go further down this, you will see yet again a very small number of people that start out at J-O-B and end up anywhere other than J-O-B or owning your job. This is someone else's job. This is owning your job. That actually make it over here to business ownership where automation, policies and procedures, accountability start taking effect, allowing that business owner to step away from the podium and allow that business to function and thrive in their absence. It is beyond rare to find anybody that makes it from J-O-B to here because to do so, you must completely kill your ego one, two, three, four, five times to get to that point. It is a complete and total recreation of one's mindset to achieve that. It is not an easy thing to do. You must constantly be killing your ego and moving to the next level to get to that. And most people, if they get to this, you will finally find a point of comfort and you'll stop getting to the next level. You must constantly kill yourself and move into a new breed to continue moving forward. And then the very last piece that we all know from Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant is the investor profile. I'm not talking about real estate investor. What I mean by investment is your cash is making you enough money to survive. Just the simple fact, like how hard would it be to make a million dollars in a year? Well, if I had a hundred million dollars, all I would need is a 10% return to do that. Do y'all see the, how, how simple it gets as you start moving further down this? At the point in time I become an investor and I have nine figures of liquid capital earning me interest, all I have to do is sit down and I'll make a million dollars a year. Most of us cannot fathom that because we have not killed ourselves that many times. Are y'all following the logic and the line set that I'm trying to put out there? Now, when I started this conversation, I said something that many people may or may not resonate with, and I said, America is not the land of equal opportunity. It is not. If I was fortunate enough to be born to parents of a business owner or investor, I have likely got a huge head start on this race. I have been indoctrinated into a different mindset. Mindset is the only difference between that side of this success line and this side of the success line. We will adapt and adopt the mindset of our surroundings. And if our surroundings is that of business ownership, our outlook on business ownership will be totally different. But many of us will have gone through a school system that has taught us employment, even through college. College just means you're a very well-educated employee. It's the truth. I have the equivalent of a sixth grade education as I stand here on this stage. And I'll explain a little bit more. This is the average person's success line. What I would like to introduce you to is the reality of America and the piece that so many people ignore and a piece that I believe is growing larger and larger every day and we are ignoring the fact that it's happening. I will move forward. This is where the average person starts. Let me show you the other side of the success line. A side that many people in this room who have not experienced and unfortunately so many people in this room have. We have the other side of the timeline. That's called broke as fuck. <laughs> Considering the outlook on that, I guess some of y'all understand that. <laughs> Let me give some explanation on broke as fuck. What happens when you grow up on government housing? What happens when your mother's 12 years old? What happens when your mother is a prostitute and your dad's a drug dealer? How much different is your life? Is that equal opportunity? It is not. Imagine placing yourself, if you have not experienced this, in the life of someone that is accustomed to being shot at in elementary school. Where is that opportunity? What happens whenever you are 13 years old and you are now selling drugs to support your prostitute mother, your drug dealing father? That is a totally different indoctrination. But people, and a lot of people are growing up over here, and I see many, many people moving this direction because this side of the success line is getting smaller and smaller every year. That is correct. But if we're starting out over here broke as fuck, where is our next step? Many of us will understand this, and it's addiction. Why is addiction so, like, over here, if you start out with J-O-B, your first step is school. 
Whenever your mother's a prostitute that's 12 years old, let me ask you, are you going to be going to school every morning? Who's your support system at that time? No one. Why is addiction the first step? It is an escape from reality. What so many people have been failed to be told, all I heard in school was drugs are bad, drugs are bad, drugs are bad. No one tells you what that first hit of heroin feels like. Now, I know there's many people in this room that will not understand that. It feels really good. And then meth and all that other stuff. Why is it that so many people end up in addiction? It's an escape from their reality. It's an escape from the abuse, the mental, physical, and sexual abuse that so many people throughout this entire success line find. Many people will start out over here in this business occupation side. But if their parents were sadistic Fs, they're likely going to quickly fall right back down to over here. And why is that? They are trying to escape reality. Does that make sense? Can we at least understand that drugs are an escape from reality? I bring a lot of this up because I want to expose some of y'all to my past. I want to expose some of y'all to the reasons why I am doing what I am doing. I want to expose some of y'all to the reasons why I stand up here on this stage and speak the way I speak and the reasons why I dress the way I dress. If I continue moving forward, many of us, once you start out in addiction, you will have to support that addiction and that will turn into a life of crime. If your mother was 12 years old and did not breed you into a life of success, waking you up every morning, getting you ready for school, what does your opportunities look like? There is a lot of money on that side. I want everybody in this room to understand that whether or not you recognize the other side of this timeline or not, I don't ask you to. I just need you to recognize that it is real. On this side, you've got the low money crimes, and that's typically addicts trying to feed their addiction. But that moves all the way up to Fortune 500 companies on that side of the timeline. You have entrepreneurs on this side of the timeline. You have people that want out of this trap but the only opportunities that they see that end up with money involve a life of crime because that is the only people that they know to look up to. Does that make sense? Do you have to agree with it? No. I want you to understand a different side of some people's lives. Moving forward from there, if we do get through this, our likely graduation is going to end up being prison. If you do really good at that side and you make a ton of money, you are almost guaranteed to graduate to prison. And most people that make it through this side of the timeline will make it through death before they ever hit J-O-B. It's an absolute truth. How many ceilings had these people had to go through just to make it to there? Sometimes if you do this really good, you get to pass all that and go straight to death. What is the difference between this side of the success line and this side of the success line? Opportunity. Is this a land of equal opportunity? We must accept that and stop saying that, you know what, it was their choice. I was one of these people over here on this side. I have had to break close to nine ceilings to get to this side of the timeline. I have gone through and seen a lot of things in my life. I could stand up in this room and put on a pinstripe suit and pretend to be some well-dressed, well-manicured businessman. I want everybody in this room to realize and understand that despite your background, there is opportunity. But the thing is, is that opportunity is not often exposed on this side of the timeline. That is exactly why we created the Propelio Academy. Could we have, thank you. Thank you. I most definitely could have put a price tag on that. It is priceless. There is no price tag I could truly put on that, and you might have a better understanding as we get closer to the end of this presentation as to why it is free. But I want everyone in this room to understand that if you are absent of opportunity within your life, and you are seeking an opportunity to get onto the other side of J-O-B, and you do want a different path for your friends and family, the opportunity is out there. This opportunity that has been provided to you came at a significant cost. Thank you. 
It, it has came at a significant cost. While it might be free to you, can you imagine how much it has cost this company? I don't think anybody in here can. Not only has it hurt us financially, it has hurt us socially. Many of the people that could help promote the academy will not do so because of the nature of the academy. You need to understand that. If they're out there selling all these different packages, many of those people are in direct opposition to what we've done because they do not understand the possibilities of the futures that it can create. And I do not dismiss them for that. I don't have any anger for them. They're trying to protect the old way. I see a new way that this country could evolve to opportunity. I think the biggest difference is equal opportunity. It, knowledge is powerful. As I've heard Brittany Washington say, but she added something else to it. Knowledge applied is powerful. I can give this all away for free, but if you don't apply it, there's no opportunity to go forward. Let me move forward. My why. My why has significantly changed over the years. When I first got started in real estate, and I have been very successful in real estate, I don't do what they call Facebook flex. I don't go out there all the time flashing stuff. If I have to flash a Lambo for you to get excited about this, then I don't consider your why to be big enough. Thank you. For those of you that truly understand the opportunity that has been given to you, and for those of you that have taken action on the opportunity given to you, understand that it is a struggle, and we are in one of the toughest market cycles there is. But I truly believe we are on the cusp of a downturn. And if you are very wise about what you are doing in real estate, that is the biggest opportunity that many of us will ever see in our lifetimes again. Be educated. Go out there and be resourceful. Learn what's going on, and if you do, you will have the opportunity of going from broke to multimillionaire. I know for a fact it's possible. I've done it. And not only did I do it, I did it starting out broke as fuck. Thank you. But my why used to be the Lambos, the big houses, and the fancy cars. I have gone through, and I still struggle daily, and I have admitted this repeatedly, with severe depression. Do not be surprised if you wake up one day and there's Facebook posts all over about me blowing my head off. It's not a joke. You do not make it from that side of the timeline to this time of the timeline without some severe struggle. One of the things that I failed to recognize starting out is chasing that big house, that fancy car, all of those things. I thought that those objects would fill the void in my mind that was causing my depression. While it would temporarily give me excitement, while it would temporarily give me that fulfillment that I seek from growing up in a severely abusive household, feeling like I was a lazy, worthless piece of shit. All I found through those objects was short-term relief, and then the depression would kick back in, and I would want to go back to bed with a gun in my mouth. What I have found in the past year is not a damn thing matters in this world other than my friends, my family, and my experience. And what I have found is it takes very little money to fulfill those three things. So what I would like to pass upon to anybody that is in the crowd chasing those big houses and those cars, I have no problems with that. If that is your dream, go for it. But if you're expecting that dream to fill a void in your mind, that void will never be filled because you will always find the next thing. 10 million will turn into 50 million. I want 100 million. I want 200 million. It will never fill the void inside until you have filled that yourself. My why. That is my sister. She had a heroin needle in her arm at 14 years old. My sister is dead. My brother is dead. My stepfather is dead. My cousin, many of them, are dead from heroin. Heroin and meth has taken complete and total control of most of my family. I stand here today as a witness to all of this. This was her boyfriend at the time. He just got his skull bashed in by a 38 on a botched drug deal. I still to this day wonder if I could have done something different to save my sister's life. Has anybody in here ever had to struggle with addiction from drugs and alcohol, either themselves or within their family, and have seen what those can do to their family. Please raise your hand 
if you've ever seen that. This is not a small thing. I am not the only person in this room that has experienced this. If you look around the room, there are many people that are experiencing this in their lives. The academy is my way. Because what happened is as I started growing further and further, as I sat there and I started looking back and I was like, all of the success that I have made has done nothing but tried to make me better. I never passed anything back down. As I looked at my closet and I see $30,000 worth of clothes, I sit there and I ask myself, what have I truly done other than for myself? I have served no one other than myself. And when I start looking at another person and I start looking at someone above me saying, you need to serve more people, I started realizing that those clothes, those houses, and those cars didn't mean a damn thing. And from that day moving forward, I've wore a pair of board shorts, flip-flops, and a gray shirt. This is the only thing that truly matters to me anymore. As long as that girl and these two ladies right over here get to live an abundant life. And they can learn what that success line looks like. And I can pass on to them the knowledge that I've had to take to kill myself nine times to get to where I'm at on that success line. I have succeeded in life. I have grown to accept that as my success. Because through being beaten severely as a child. I'm talking about rolling pins, bench vices, and baseball bats. I am very well accustomed to being able to shut my brain down and take a beating. You learn that when you're three years old and you're going against a 140-pound woman. This right here is my why. Now, last night I said something to the world and I said I am shutting the Propelio events down. Why? I need everyone in this room to see some of this. For cl close to a decade, for close to a decade, I took severe mental and physical abuse. By the time I was in middle school, seeing my friends get shot was not outside of the norm. Going from that to where I am at today, I still, to this day, struggle with the inner thoughts of you are a worthless, lazy piece of shit. Because that is what I was told and beat into my head from the time I was this tall. I still struggle with daily feeling like I have not given enough back to this world. Because I am a lazy, worthless piece of shit. I know. But I've got to figure my way out of it. I'm hoping so. Or I will be dead. But moving forward from there, Propelio I consider to be a huge success, especially from where I have came from. Not only in and of itself, but to consider what I've had to do to go from where I went from to where I stand today. I must accept that there is a level of success to that. While I cannot personally feel that, I do not in any capacity at all realize that there is a success here. I want everyone in this room to realize I am shutting this event down for a reason. Because so many of y'all do not understand. When I sit here and say, I want to give everything I possibly can back to this world, I am not joking. Does anybody in here know how to read financial statements? From 2015 to 2018, what's that P&L look like? Negative what? Negative $1.2 million. Who do you think is bankrolling all of that? My name, my equity, and my life. How much money have I made off of y'all? None. What does 2019 look like? A $576,000 loss. This is not free. The academy was not free. This event is not free. The software that y'all use is not free. What I want everyone in this room to realize is when I sit up here at the front of the room and say, I truly want to change lives. I'm not making a dime off of this. I was extremely successful in real estate investing. I sat there and I saw me wearing $1,500 $1, worth of clothes. And then I sat there and saw my cousins dying 
from heroin. And I had to sit there and ask myself, am I truly serving anyone other than myself? So if anybody asks why I am shutting the Propelio events down, just remember, I've already invested close to $2 million into this community. If y'all would like to see this community survive, I have one more property that I can do a cash out refi on. It'll likely pull another 800 to 1.2 million out of my current net worth, which I have seen drastically drop over the past five years. I hit about 11 million at one point in time. I'm down to almost nothing. How much more do you want me to commit to this? If y'all want this to survive, I need help. Spread the word. I need to get the software pumped up somehow. The software is the only thing that can help me bankroll this. If y'all have any desire to see this community grow, help me get the word out about the academy. Help me get the word out about the software. Because I've got about another year of my own personal finances to keep this alive before I shut it down. I don't, I, I'm not charging for the academy. That's off the table. The academy is and forever will be free. If y'all want to support, I need you to help me get the word out on the software itself. Do I understand that there are bugs in the software? Yes. I would also like you to understand how much software development costs. Thank you. I have an affiliate program. If y'all want to join the affiliate program and help share the word and become a part of Propelio Success through your own payments, the affiliate program is open to you. If you are out there and you see all of these what they like to call themselves gurus and durus out there, ask them to show you their financial statements. And I'd be, willing to, I'd be willing to bet their financial statements look a little different than mine, and I'd be willing to bet you would be surprised where they're getting their revenue from. All I have to say is if you start following these durus and you want to help this community, reach out to that duru and say, will you help us support the Propelio Academy? And if they say no, can you ask them where their heart truly is? Do you follow that? Am I being too intense? I know that I have an intense personality. How I grew up and where I am at today embodies an intense personality. I had to survive. Say it again. But for everybody that wants to say I'm a no HUD guru, I've got the HUDs to show you. I saw an opportunity to help people, and I truly wanted to. I can clearly show you that those financial statements clearly indicate that I have committed a lot to helping a lot of people. All I'm asking out of you is to help me spread the word. If y'all can do that for me, I can keep this going, but I cannot keep bankrolling this forever. You asked me to charge you. All I'm asking is to not be running in the red every single year. If y'all can help me spread the word and keep me out of the red, that's all I ask for. I'm not asking for this company to be worth $20 billion, $50 billion, $100 billion. All I'm asking y'all for the help of is help me get it out of the red because all I've got is one more year to give you. And that's the end of it. Y'all understand what I'm asking for today. Thank you. I don't have anything else to say, but for everybody that has showed us support along the way, thank you. For every one of y'all that have ever showed up to one of these events, I want to say thank you. And after I made that post last night, I want to go ahead and say thank you to RJ and Cassie, because they have both agreed to step up and take over the event and keep it going in your name. So. I'd like to welcome them out. You got a mic? No. Come on out, man. Come on out. Y'all got mics? I'd like them to take over the show. So, who here's lives have been impacted by Daniel and Propelio?
So Daniel says that he wants to change people's lives. I think all of us can agree that he's changed each and every one of our lives. Um, the only people that we here, these, these fine people that we call titanium investments, um, the only people that we serve is our Lord Jesus Christ. And Daniel asked me to come to a meeting a couple of months ago or a couple of weeks ago. And um, he shared some intimate information with us. Uh, we were lucky enough to, to be at, you know, in his presence and he shared his knowledge. And uh, I realized he serves the same Lord that I do and that we do. And uh, last night when I saw the post, I immediately knew what we had to do. I looked at Cassie. I said, we should keep the event going. Um, we've, we've hosted our golf tournament for three years now. We have some knowledge on events. We've partnered up with Dutch, who is background with events, videography, things like that. Um, and this morning, Edwin has a ton of uh, he has a, a great of relationship with Daniel as anyone, and uh, I came in the office today, and I asked Dutch and Edwin, I said, hey, you're going to the event, right? It's the last one, and they both looked at me and said, we have to keep it going, and so there's nothing more perfect than when everybody's on the same page, so we want to keep it going. We're going to continue to call it the Propelio event. We're going to keep it the exact same way, uh, but Daniel asked something out of all of us, and that is... Daniel has been open and honest about the fact that he's not good at selling Propelio. And all of us need to do that for him. He asked. Daniel struggles with, with asking for help. He's open and honest about that as much as he puts himself out there. He asked for all of our help. So we're going to step up. We're going to help him as much as possible. We ask that you guys do the same. Y'all enjoy the rest of the show tonight. Kind of glad I forgot to turn the mic on because I was telling them there were some bad mofos. That was awesome. So thank you all. Glad we're joining us. Obviously, tough to come up and follow after that. That was powerful. Um, and I hope everyone does help and signs up. Obviously, the affiliate program is a great way to spread the word and also have it tagged to you. So we're going to start the uh, short-term uh, short rental panel. Um, let me grab the other guys. I have a lot of questions from y'all that text it. Still feel free to text me. My phone number is 512-417-2348, and I'll get, make certain that your questions are answered. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, you've heard, you recognize our speakers who've already spoke, um, but we have added Kristen Gers. I think everyone knows Kristen, <laughs> the note lady. I'll never forget the first time I met Kristen was listening to your speech here, and you talked about making money on demo, and it blew my mind. Blew my mind. So I am going to start the mic with you. Yeah, it's cold up here. Sorry, y'all. Our first question, um, I had many repeated questions, but I'm going to kind of go through what I think seems like a natural flow. Run arbitrage. Uh, they were talking about, I've had questions about approaching the landlord. And we, we had some of that discussed in your last speech, or your last presentation, Milani. But when you're speaking to the landlord, if they are unfamiliar with rent arbitrage or what you're trying to accomplish, how do you tell them the benefit of allowing you to use their property to become a short-term rental for you? Yeah, good question. So they will be unfamiliar with what we're asking. You guys, I, I'm just meeting you guys. Do you guys do arbitrage as well? No? Okay. Oh, okay. So with arbitrage, you're definitely going to want to touch on uh, 
a few points. One yep. is you're going to tell them about how you are using a regular contract. A reg I keep saying those words, a regular contract. You're going to talk about how clean you're going to leave it. You're going to talk about how you get reviewed multiple times a week or month. You're going to talk about how you, once you move furniture into this property, you want to have a relationship with them for a long time, okay? So you are trying to say, I am in this for a long haul, and we want to work together for a long time. And when you are ready to sell the property, I want to buy it. Okay, so not only do they think I have a potential ten tenant, but when I'm ready, I also have a potential buyer. Love it, love it. Anyone else have anything else to add? So uh, I, I, I just have a quick question, and mm -hmm. I and I don't know if anybody's worried about this. Um, if you're in Dallas, I've noticed that there's a lot of properties coming about, and people ask me this. They're like, "Is there a saturation?" And I know during certain months, it's more expensive to rent than it is to buy. Technically. So your profits, of course, go down, and is rent arbitrage dangerous at all during certain months of the year due to low Satur profits? Saturation? Yeah, sure. Saturation yeah. and low profits. Yeah. So my, my answer is, is you've got to be smart about it. You've got to make sure that you are analyzing the comps very, very well so that you know your worst case scenario, you know your best case scenario. You're going to create a range. Um, if you were in here before or if you want to, you can text BNB to 33777 and I'll send you the analyzer I use because I'm all about ranges because I want to know if, if you were in here, you know, that I hate risk and that I really want to know the worst case scenario and the best case scenario based on my comps that uh, you're going to run. So also, it's really important to make sure that it is allowed. So there are a lot of condos out there right now that are being Airbnb. Those are illegal for 99% of the time they are. They are going to get caught for most part. They may get shut down. So if you're looking at renting a place, make sure that there's no HOA. Make sure that there's nothing that's going to stop you from doing that. So that actually was a question. Mm -hmm. What about if zoning is changing and doesn't allow it? Austin's dealing with that. I'm getting fucked Areas right now. like Let's just go there. Uh, areas like Houston don't have zoning, so it's deed restrictions, or there's HOAs that don't allow it. What is the best way for someone to find whether short-term renting is allowed in that community, in that area, or for that property? You need to get online. You need to, if, so, for instance, right now we are in, I'm not sure, are we in Dallas or Tarrant County? Either or. But if you get online, all of the HOAs are required to record what their HOA laws are. Mm. So I have two currently, and they're lovely. They love me. Unfortunately, there's a bun there are a bunch of other assholes mm. that are owners. <laughs> Sorry, am I now? I can't say asshole. Sorry. No, fuck. I love it. Fuck, I fuck, love it. fuck. No, anyways. Um, no, there are a lot of other guys. There are a lot of other guys renting out their properties for just nightly Airbnbs. It clearly specified in these HOA rules that no short-term rentals were allowed. But if it doesn't say you require a one-year lease by Texas statutes and track, that means 30 days. So I went in there and I said, okay, I need a minimum of 30 days for you to stay there. Mm -hmm. Thus, I was getting away with it. They just now went in there and changed the rules on me. Oh, yeah, requiring a one-year lease, and I've been there a year and a half. So what happens with that? There's a lot of different things. Really, I'm trying to kick the can down the road and hope that Texas legislation steps in and said is, says that it's illegal for them to require a one-year lease because, quite frankly, you can have a six-month lease sure. on any other property, but if somebody, you know, in this case, technically they can – find me and kick me out so another thing I'd add to yeah, some so places also only allow up to a percentage so finding out how many are already known short-term rentals okay yeah so on the arbitrage piece when you're talking to a landlord a few other things that you might want to consider are you can tell them hey look I'll pay a quarter of the year up front would that be sexy to a landlord that's actually a great tip I like that tip. Uh, pay a quarter of the year up front pay half of the year hey your deposit's three grand, I'll pay six grand. Does that work for you? Did you because to entice the landlord because you to entice be the landlord to sign a lease with you so that you can Airbnb it. If you know that regular rents in area are a thousand dollars, but 
based upon your data research in that area, you can get 2,500 a month, and their their deposit's three grand, and you say, hey, I'll give you five grand. That's just two months of rent up front, and you get to cash flow the rest of the time where you convince them to do something that maybe they didn't do before. The other thing you can tell them is that when you rent to somebody, do you know how often they clean when they move in? Okay, well, if you're working with us, we'll give you a guarantee. We'll, we'll, we'll come to a lease agreement, and just so you know, when someone stays, they pay a professional cleaning cleaning fee, so we know real time that the, that the property's been updated, cleaned professionally, where, where you don't know that when you rent out to somebody for a full year. Do you guys, guys and gals see where that might be a benefit yeah, as well? absolutely. Better okay. maintain property. That's fantastic. So just take note of that. I mean, so it, exit it's, it's strategy making money out of thin air. If right? you're in like Kristen's situation where suddenly it's not allowed, something changes, zoning, deeds, or things out of your control. Oh, no, 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 what no. What kind of exit strategies? Oh, I've got one-year leases on my current people that just moved in nice. the first week in January. And, you know, I went to them and just said, I will write in there, there's no cancellation penalty whatsoever if you decide to just up and move out. <laughs> but I got a goddamn <laughs> one-year lease on it, and here you go. Enjoy. <laughs> I love that. I think that's hilarious. It's If there's anything, who says real estate investors are problem solvers? We all do. I love that. It's, you know, it's a loophole. You got a one-year signed lease. Enjoy it. Yeah. Enjoy what you've got. I, again, what are, what, what are they going to do? Um, they're claiming that they're going to fine me $250. Well, guess what? I got better lawyers than they do, and they're <laughs> really not. <laughs> so talking about risk goes into another question that, w that popped up was, are you using a special lease? And are you getting a, sp a special insurance, property insurance, or otherwise to cover, obviously, your rent the rental unit if you are using rent arbitrage? I, I, I'm an owner, so I'm going to try that. So I'm an owner, so I'm not going to be, I mean, I have property insurance that covers the entire dwelling plus yeah. content. And this was really geared so towards the rent arbitrage. It's, like, it's are you getting geared renter's re insurance? Is there a different and type of business? But you need who to do, you do use renter. For your I mean, you've got to have insurance because, I mean, the cost to furnish an Airbnb for one bedroom for me is eight to ten thousand dollars. Jeez. Well, I've got high end chinchilla rugs. I got a, I got high end <laughs> stuff. I got a nice place. But you, if you're talking about eight to ten thousand dollars. I mean, you go up to a four or five bedroom house. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. talking about substantial cash outlays. I would hope you would have that insured. Sometimes I don't, guys. I'll be honest. The reason why I say that is because it depends on what you're really trying to protect. Okay, the insurance I have, if I own the property, I have. Uh, who do you use for your owner, like your short-term rental insurance? Yeah. The fabulous Kim Stallings, is she here in this room? No. She was. Kim. Uh, she's at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, so Kim Stallings with Heritage. So she's got heritage. all of my. Is it just Texas? Do you do any out of states? No, I just. Okay. No, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Herod, so look into Heritage. A, a nationwide one that is very common is CBIZ, C-B-I-Z dot com. Um, they definitely know their short-term rental insurance policies. There's lots of different things they offer, um, including sometimes even for rentals. So if you're doing arbitrage model, you can use them. I have a general liability, a blanket policy for my general liability, okay? That's not going to cover my furnishings, but if somebody trips and falls, that covers me for that, okay? Then you're also going to want to look at whatever platform you're using. If they're booking through Airbnb, if they're booking through whatever they're booking through, you want to see what insurance they have for your furnishings, for your items, for your other things. Which they do have. That's which they do, d yes. So, but you need to know the difference between which platforms you're on, and maybe that's a reason not to use some platforms, okay? Um, but I'll like, we'll talk about Airbnb. That's kind of the most common one uh, that we've talked about tonight. They have a, a, a great policy, but also just last year, correct me if I'm wrong, but when they, they changed their security deposit, which is so much better, where now it says that you you can ask for a security deposit. I asked for a security deposit on a th for $1,000 on all, all of my properties. They don't actually take $1,000 from them they keep the credit card and you can access their credit card number for 14 days after they check out. So I have 14 days to make a claim on any damaged property, any missing property, that kind of thing. And here's the other thing too, you need to, and I, sorry to be the bad guy, uh, read 
what they cover and what they don't cover. So when you guys do that, the cool thing is, is that these platforms that help you book, because they get a they get a percentage of your booking fee, right? So they'll they'll give you a good in, they'll give you insurance on it, right? They'll, up to a million dollars or whatever for damage, but you need to read the fine print, like fine art not covered typically. So th there's certain things that are covered or not covered. So it's the one time that that you know, we will tell you to read everything start to finish on what they cover and what they don't cover so that at least you know ahead of time so you know any other supplemental insurance that you need to get. Fair? Here's the other thing. I like to get lots of bookings. Um, I don't charge <laughs> a security deposit. I just don't. Um, I have insurance for a reason. Insurance covers everything. But again, I'm a property owner, and that's a whole different story than doing lease arbitrage. Um, you know, and I'm hoping you're going to ask about what are the pitfalls of lease arbitrage? Because it is. It's seriously, if you've got no money, it's a great place to start and get into it. Just go for it. Go for it, learn it, and talk about it. Yeah. So I didn't start charging a security deposit until they changed it about seven months ago. But now I haven't had a single guest complain about the thousand dollars security deposit because they know they're going to keep it in good thing if anything it scares people off and so i don't have a problem but i can speak to that security deposit we also find though they may they just may look over your bookings because you have to be competitive on airbnb and so if you're adding additional fees they may bypass your listing and go to somebody that's not at, you know, in charging a security deposit. So we don't ch charge a security deposit. Well, they deposit. might always think that you're a nervous Nelly landlord that's not ready to be doing this, and you expect me to take better care of your property than you do, and I might be worried that you're going to nickel and dime me for anything, especially if I have kids well, or a dog. Yes, yes. And, and, and it also should be noted, I mean, Airbnb, everybody out here, yes, Airbnb, you need a pulse to make money on Airbnb. And I've said that for a while. You need a freaking pulse. It's become the Coke of the soda fountain. It's become <laughs> the Vaseline of petroleum jelly, right? It's oh all air and B and B. But I've been but I've been using something like this for 15, 20 years, VRBO. I mean, there's been tons of these platforms. But it hasn't gained popularity since Airbnb. So yeah. when you're talking about this, yeah, it, for me personally, I have always, I've rented a ton over the last 15 years in Europe, in Colorado, going skiing. And when I do that, I see a, I see I can't book instantly. Boom, bypass you. I see Amen. that I have to pay a security deposit. Boom, ba bypass you. Am I every renter? No. But no. do I set up my Airbnbs like I feel people would want to be rented to? I do. Again, it's two different philosophies to rent to. Is so one right or wrong? It's not. It's so really not. I mean, Talking about the changes in 2019 that you brought up, yeah. one of the questions we had was, Airbnb changed their fee structure in 2019. So how are you adapting? Are you changing your rates or services or changing to other platforms or transitioning by creating your own client and prospect list they can market to? Uh, so uh, to be honest, I didn't change a ton, but I did start looking at other platforms. To me, uh, guests are still booking. I'm still making money. I'm still happy. So I didn't need to change anything. Yes, Airbnb changed a few things. They're always changing things. Um, my, uh, now this is great for some people, not for others, but if people come to my, uh, properties, then they know that they can come back and book through my website and save on those fees, um, which, uh, is a whole nother ball of wax, but, uh, yeah, so I, I didn't change a lot. Yeah, so folks, uh, you know, you, you control what you can control. So sometimes they change fee structures, right, but... Uh, that's where you that's where you do your best to roll out the red carpet for people who do stay with you so you can get repeat bookings if you get repeat bookings you have the relationship with them you have their information once once they book with you you guys can uh, communicate directly back and forth if you roll out the red carpet you get rebookings and you eliminate all those fees so if you put if you put your best foot forward on the front end then you can experience rebooking on the back end without any of the fees from the third party sites. Does, it, does, everybody, does that make sense for everybody? Absolutely. Right? So it's so interesting a you good say that. Like in Fredericksburg them. and some of the other little towns like that where it's destinations, there's one group or two groups, I guess, that seem to have a ton of houses, 
and they're no longer on Airbnb or VRBO. They just, you go to their website and book them. And whenever I book it or buy a gift certificate, because it's the best gift ever for my dad, he doesn't want another shirt, um, you know, it's, they've created their own niche market. They've created their own. So, but I would think that would be difficult here in, say, a large Dallas area, unless you owned enough properties to be well known. When, would that be the case, or do you uh, think? I would. T I would tell you this. Um, we we focus a lot of effort on the front end on that red carpet experience. We we go above and beyond, do tons of stuff. Uh, so we built out like. That actually was a question about how to become a super host. Mm -hmm. What little touches do you do? Uh, gosh, it, a welcome. We do we do mints on the pillow. We we offer to do their laundry for them, which blows their minds. Here's the thing, 90% of them don't want you touching their dirty drawers. But the fact that you offer it, they're like, okay, you, like, they even say, like, they're, they just start, they're like, you just blew us away. Like, you're really going to do our laundry? Like, yeah, whatever we can do to help you. We want you, we want you to enjoy your stay and have the best experience, and it literally blows their mind. Do you have a pickup service? Yeah, we have a pickup service, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I had a super host that was in Greenville, North Carolina, and, or South Carolina, sorry. Um, they had beer and a six pack of, I think it was Coors Light, nothing wonderful, um, and a bottle of just generic yellow or white wine. I don't drink wine. I, I said yellow. Sorry, y'all. Shows my ignorance. Um, and they had a book, a welcome book, with a bunch of um, menus. But then people had written into the book. It was just a notebook, and it was like, hey, we checked out this bar around the corner. Asked for so and so. This was great. And for us to have never been there, to lit, we went through those tips and felt like we had the best cheat sheet that was a real person's cheat sheet versus what Travel Magazine is going to tell me to do that everybody else is doing. So, yeah, I don't do, I mean, I offer it as an additional service to go do somebody's laundry. Hey, you don't want to do laundry? I've got a laundry service, and it's pickup. But that's for an additional fee. I also have, oh, do you want an additional mid-stay cleaning? Sure, that's an additional fee. But I don't offer it for free. And you've got to find that latte factor, right, when you're doing this. What do I have? Um, my shampoo. Shampoo, cream rinse, and body soap all comes from L'Occitane en Provence which is about that with the hand soap is $150 for four bottles. So when I do the refills of those, but it's in my advertisement, my beds are all Weston heavenly beds from the e-commerce site, which is $2,000 a mattress. So now we know why your budget is here. <laughs> why, why am I spending 10 grand on a one bedroom? There you go. I don't have a stitch of Ikea furniture in it. However, every dish and piece of silverware comes from Ikea. Why? It's easily to be replaced. And yeah, no one's going to notice. And nobody's going to notice. So again, you know, you've got to find that latte factor on all of this and find, all right, what little things are really a latte factor is where most real estate investors go broke. A, lot, a latte factor is when you're doing a real estate investment, like you go to a rehab and you're going to do a rehab bid, and you leave off things like door handles, door stops, mm. and baseboards. The details. The details. And you, do you know that a door handle is going to cost you <laughs> like 50 to $75 a piece for every new door handle that you install? Why? Because it takes somebody time to uninstall the first one and put in the new one plus the cost of the hardware. So if you think that that's a free item, it's not. Um, that's what I call the latte factor in real estate investing. It's where you don't have your lights or you don't have electricity or your heating and air on something that you can control remotely from your smartphone and you've got this higher electricity cost and you're paying a couple hundred bucks extra a month for electricity when you shouldn't be. All of these things, you've got to find, all right, what can we save money on that they're not going to notice? So you and, tell and, me and, then, and then give them the extras. I have, you know, I have two bags of microwave popcorn that cost me a quarter every time somebody checks in and some hot chocolate, you know. Other things that we do, we offer to get their groceries. So when they book, oh, we, said, we send an immediate email back, hey, tell us what you like to eat. And again, we charge for that. 
but literally they show up in their fridges stocked. Who would like to show up at a place to stay with every piece of favorite food? And but, not but, coordinate but yet, the delivery, yeah. Yeah, not everybody wants it. You offer it, right? Offer. Yeah, so she does shamp- high-end shampoo. We offer to bathe them. No. I'm, jo- <laughs> I'm just joking. That would be an extra fee. <laughs> I've been, I feel cheap. I'm happy when they have coffee filters and coffee. Uh, and coffee filters more <laughs> than anything. <laughs> I, I mean, it. I think the one thing we haven't heard, though, is the cleanliness is the number one thing. Your house has got to be absolutely plan- clean. It has to have all those fine details. They will find every little hair. They will find everything. And that will start it off. If they find one thing wrong, they'll go find every other thing Well, now they're looking for the it, property. right? That's correct. So cleanliness dust is bunnies. number one. And communication. They, they will complain about dust bunnies, folks. Yeah. Mm. They will complain about Make everything. Sure it's one little hair in the in the all in right, the shower, right. and then also communication. Can they get a hold of you? They need to be able to get a hold of you. If they've got something going on, Let, let's go back to cleaning. Hmm? No, I've got a good I've got a good anecdote for cleaning. So I when I first started this, I used you know my cleaning lady, and she'd go in there and you know I was I don't know she was charging me thirty bucks in whatever, and I was charging it back as. 30 bucks to clean this little one bedroom, one bath condo. And then I got a real service, five star cleaning service, and they're phenomenal. And everything is always perfect, and the laundry is done. And do you know how much I pay for that? Instead of 30, I'm paying 100 bucks. And then I said, well, how can I, how can I eat that cost? And the owner said, oh, you need to charge that back. And so I went from a $30 cleaning fee to a $100 cleaning fee. You know what happened? My bookings went up. Interesting. We have a question. So, yeah. Uh, I had a quick oh. question for the panel. Um, I heard a lot of you guys describing different nuanced things that you provide for your guests. And I was curious to see, do you feel that that may open you up for liability as well? For instance, if you were to provide things like wine, peanuts, if you have a recovering alcoholic or an allergy to something that you provide in the house, do you feel that that also could open you up to a point of liability? That's a good question because I do provide, because welcome to Texas. So I provide Shiner Bach and Shiner Blonde, two cans of each, along with Coke, Diet Coke, and Sprite. How do y'all handle it? How do y'all so handle that kind of That's in my Airbnb. Do you even not worry about it? It's not just for yeah. you random folks. We do water bottles, and we do a, like a trail mix that is sealed, and then popcorn. So mitigate it by you're not immediately exposed to it if you don't want to exactly. be. Yeah, we don't provide any alcohol. We, we, we provide little snacks, water, this, that, and the other thing. That's why you can offer it. If, if they make the choice for you to get something to bring into the property, which you, can make, which you can make money off of, and it gives them a better experience, you get a positive review, they rebook, everyone else sees that you got a good review, it starts to snowball and you make more money. But, yeah, we don't, uh, you know, we don't give them parachutes and say jump off the roof or anything. Yeah. I actually have a question for you three. So, and sorry, y'all, but you can benefit off of this. Wait, sorry. Is it okay? Just on that liability real quick. One of my students just this week was like, they're not signing my liability waiver. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And she said, before they get in my pool, I want them to sign my liability waiver. And I said, good luck getting them all to sign that. Like, that's just crazy. So, but there are things that you can do to protect yourself of putting the no lifeguard on duty into at your own risk sign. You know, so make sure that you're, you're covering yourself on those other things. But I also don't think and like talk to your insurance agent about something called an umbrella policy. Everybody write that down, okay? Umbrella policy. Okay, sorry. Go get one question. Because that will, if you think that because your LLC is renting these out or owns these, that you're protected, you're freaking not, okay? It's called an umbrella seat. Get a $2 million umbrella policy from your insurance agent, then you're protected. Yeah. What was your other question? So we only have a few minutes, so we'll try to... I I actually have a question for for these folks. So, I mean, that's a good thing, you know, because I provide just popcorn, and then I do provide Shiner and Shiner Blonde, but you all don't provide little snacks. I mean, our owners, they can if they want. Um, we We don't recommend it, like even spices. Spices, well, be spices careful. Oregano bad. may not be oregano, right? Salt may not be salt. It's all those type of things. I know that a lot of people think, well, nobody's going to do anything. But, you know, people, 
can do things. And I, yeah. in an urban environment, you never know, right? I mean, it's, it's. So I don't provide that, but a sealed pack of popcorn, yes. So I provide two popcorns. And if then the owner wants to provide that, we can put it out there for them, but we don't, we will not purchase that or do anything of that nature. And, and encourage that. More liability. Yeah, there's, there's so a many dude. Properties. Um, while he's coming up, I just want to hit on the super host thing. I think so many people put so much emphasis on the super host thing. Like, oh no, I'm not a super host anymore. Those out. They, they so throw them out like candy. Perfect. But also, you get one person that found one fly on the doorstep that gives you a one star, and you're not going to be a super host for a little bit, guys. So don't let it, a bad review like totally bring you down but be smart about it because uh well there's a couple different things one there's ways to get your reviews back up okay there's ways to uh have friends stay in there and give you five star reviews if it's that bad you can start a new account when you're starting account you can have multiple accounts depending on the area depending on the level of the property you can choose if you want your four star properties to be with your five star properties depending on what's going on in the neighborhood that you're in if it sounds like she's in like a five five star pro area but some of my areas i do some five star pro areas but i also have some that are in 4.7 neighborhoods so i do my four and my five star properties together on an account okay so there's creative ways you've got to be strategic about ha how you handle it but don't let a bad review and not being a super host like ruin you because it's really not that big of a deal hi I'm Matt Villard from Flowermont Texas longtime uh, real estate investor in the area in Oklahoma as well and uh, I also wanted to s ask you all I have a brother who just bought a property north of Colorado Springs in Monument and uh, he wants to become a first-time Airbnb host, and he's very new to the whole system and platform. I'm just asking for ideas for mistakes. I know this is more of an expert panel, but trying to get some ideas for him because he's trying to launch in the next 10 days uh, to take advantage of the summer bookings up there for the weather and everything. My biggest tip is do not use Airbnb smart pricing. Yeah. Uh, it <laughs> is... <laughs> It is trash. Um, no, I know it's it's uh, Airbnb's goal is to get these properties booked. My goal is to make money, and so Airbnb's algorithm is not what I want. But I do recommend using a third-party dynamic pricing tool. Um, I use. Uh, I don't know what you guys use. What do you guys use for right now pricing? for um, dynamic pricing? Oh, you uh, guys have your own, right? We have our own system. Price Labs. Price Labs. There's. Um, Beyond pricing, I mean, there's a lot of them out there. If you just check it out, I use use Wheelhouse and Beyond pricing. If you're going to be a first timer and you're not local or not certain what you're doing, I would think that you would want to use a management company to get your feet up and running so yeah, you understand well, I would, what you're doing. I would suggest that if he's brand new, you know, you put it up. It's going to be a learning experience for him. Um, uh, I agree with you. Don't take the suggested pricing, right? And, uh, but you can still go on to some of these management sites, just so you know, like Evolve Vacation Rental. I think they're based out of Colorado. Uh, they have 10,000 properties, so they kind of have some of that stuff down to a science. You could, you could tell your brother to go on there, and they have checklists. Hey, if you're listing your property, here are the 15 things or the 30 things that you need to consider before you go live with your listing. Mm. So there's resources and stuff out there. Like um, uh, as I said earlier when, when I was up here, um, going over <laughs> ways to get extra income or whatever, uh, you can go on Facebook, you can go to uh, Airbnb Investment Blueprint in there and start asking questions. There's a community of a 1,000 people in there. So if it's their first time going live, you can go in there and ask questions, and everyone in that community will start answering the stuff for you. If so it's a first-time rental, it, I'll just say this real fast and go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, it's first-time rental, uh, again, I will go straight back to checklists. Like we have straight checklists that we go off of to make sure you don't miss things, like little things, like somebody's gonna come in there and enjoy themselves around vacation, they want, a, they want a glass of wine, yet you didn't you didn't provide a wine opener. I think the thing for your brother, because I am from around that area, he needs to know every event that's going on. He needs to know when the Air Force Academy graduation's going on. He needs to know all the, like the, even the, all the marathons and things that are going on in that area. So he needs to go and research what is actually happening around that area. He should also look at all the competition around him. Every single home that's on Airbnb around there, look inside, look at their listings, look at how they furnished it, how can he stand apart from them? What are people doing that so that he can actually be unique in a nature? Because you're selling an experience. You're not just selling a place to stay. You're selling an experience that they're gonna walk away with and you're gonna immerse them in a new 
culture and a new experience, and that's the way to look at it. Okay, so the advice I give for everybody trying to do this and trying to figure out what to do, go on like you're going to go shop for a place to stay and see what jumps out at you in those photos. Usually it's a piece of art. And so I'm very picky about the pieces of art that I hang, and I try to have something that anchors every property. Um, I usually theme them. If you suck at decorating, decorating an Airbnb is fun, okay? So pick a theme. I don't care what it is. Monkeys, okay? Every <laughs> photo is about goddamn monkeys. But you know what? All of a sudden, you're going to have these pieces of art, and you're going to throw some couches in there, and you're going to be like, this place is badass. And people are gonna, oh, people are going to rent it because of the goddamn monkeys. What is the number one thing when you're renting on Airbnb? Pictures. Yeah. You are not a professional photographer. I don't care who the fuck you are sitting out there. You suck at taking photos. Pay Ouch. the $200. $200. That's how much it freaking costs. And go have professional photos taken. Believe me, they're professionals at taking real estate photos. If you don't have professional photos out there, your listing sucks. Here's the other thing. Have someone proofread your goddamn paragraph. <laughs> if I am reading this and I see, I shit you not, I literally read this today on, yes, I just got it. I was late tonight to this because I had a four-hour interview to take over four mm. million-dollar properties here in Dallas and that I'm going to manage. And I've always said I'm not going to manage. And I read these listings, and I almost peed myself laughing because it literally said, it was like, hi, this is an RJ property, exclamation mark. Who's RJ? That be me. That, <laughs> T-H-A-T, B-E, me. So that's how people are writing these. You know what? In your entry paragraph, tell me why I want to stay there. I want to stay there because it's close to the double AC. It's close to Katy Trail. I can get there. I can have a $5 Uber ride to anywhere in the city that I really want to go. That's the stuff you need to say in there. So you want to make money on Airbnb? Have a good paragraph that tells me, you know, why would you want to visit a certain place? You want to go see something. So have some really badass photographs and have something good that doesn't tell me, you know, that be me. We're at the end of our time, but we had one question that was actually a pretty good one. That um, Airbnbs, short-term rentals, seem to focus around hospitality, pleasure, you know, adver anything that someone would be traveling towards. This individual uses Airbnb to book for employees over hotels when they're traveling to keep morale up. He's asking, what is the big difference between corporate housing and short-term rentals? Nothing, I target corporate. I, I go into corporate with a uh, brochure that directs them to my booking website yeah. so that I'm not up against Airbnb. Um, that's good. But, but I, I use it, I, that's one of my My website I, is called Dallas housing. Elite Corporate Rentals. Yeah. Okay. And all, f like, the four that I own, so these are my four, just my personal ones that I own, they're at 100% occupied through the end of April. Nice. So, so I think also corporate rental can also be 30 days or more. Some people will see that as that as well. Okay. But, you know, another thing that to think about when you're looking at properties that I find really popular with corporate is duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes are absolute fair diamonds. Because you can rent them out as one, one and one, one, two and three, or you can rent them out solely. So if somebody is with the company and they have four employees that are trying to look for a place, they can all stay together, but they have their own separate space. Sure. So when you're looking at places as well, think about those multi-units because they're very powerful and you get a lot more listings. That's brilliant. Because yeah, the there's a lot of people using sh uh, corporate rentals. Um, it's people going to nursing school or something of that nature or working on a project. That's actually good. I like that. Yeah, correct. So what you want to do when you go live with your listing is look up all the big corporations around that property, and I would deliver a brochure to all those big companies and say, hey, can you give this to your HR department? If you guys have trainings where you bring people in, we'd love for you to consider our property and because uh, that will save you from them booking through the sites too, and, and that's more income for you because you're bypassing management fees. Does everybody get that? Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. I love Questions? Yeah. 
it is it currently an Airbnb or it's your personal home? So, so I have the 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 one unit the one community where I'm having a problem. Um, so I had there are two bedroom two baths in each of this in this condo community, and I have rented them out individually to nurses, traveling nurses. So you can find them on it's technically furnishedfinder.com, but it's also traveling nurses. So if you just search up traveling nurses, it's a huge industry. And I don't know what the hell is going on in the water in Dallas, but it has exploded. Do you feel like traveling Los- nurses ask you for discounts? They are fucking cheap as shit. <laughs> I was going to say, I actually don't do traveling nurses anymore because they are so cheap. And I understand. I'm grateful for what so they do. But they're looking for average minute. rent. They're not looking for All a short-term right. rental rent. So the person that I have moving into one of my my fourth one, right, I don't even have this advertised anywhere. She came off of some other listing that happened to be booked. Um, I booked her, I don't know, four or five weeks ago. She moves in on Saturday and says stays until the end of April, April 30th, right? And I just had the photographs professionally taken yesterday on this place. She tried, oh, she tried to get me down on price. She tried, 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 tried. Came back, came back, came back. So what I tell all landlords out there, go out and search how many places are available for 60 to 90 days in Dallas, in a good neighborhood, close to where these hospitals are that they're working. They don't have a lot of choice. So if they truly want a one bedroom to be by themselves, to actually live, they're paid well. They can afford it. They have the per diem to afford it. If they want that, they will pay you. And so I don't negotiate on my terms anymore. I don't come down. Um, so here, here's one technique for you, sir. Uh, during those uh, weekly times where the booking rate's obviously less, what, what I would tell you to do is drop the rate but then up the cleaning fee because dropping the rate gets more eyeballs on it and you still kind of even yourself out. It's a little technique. That's clever. That's 15 clever. seconds down and dirty, nasty shit. Did that answer your question? I love it. That was good. Well, thank y'all. We've run out of time. I appreciate all of your joining us, especially since I know it's a long night. Thank you all so much for sharing with all of us today and all of your knowledge. Um, I know that this is all on YouTube. We had an average of over 60 viewers uh, throughout the entire time. So that's a lot of people making contact to you. So congratulations and thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Real quick, I forgot to mention about just a plug for Propelio Academy. Have your brother go on to Propelio Academy. There's some stuff on there. So Yeah, if y'all haven't checked it out, there's a lot of great information on there. Fantastic. Well, thank y'all. I appreciate it. Go out and spread the love of Propelio and let us know how we did. And I appreciate all of you. Again, my name is Kelly Smith with Easy Street Capital. Thanks. I appreciate y'all.